the wine is pouring and let me tell you a tale about my dad and the pig uh 25 years ago my dad went on a holiday trip to spain and he came back and he was very kind of well like he would come back with the suitcase and he would open up the suitcase and he would have sweets for us uh, but this time around he didn't he didn't want to show what was in the suitcase it was very very private that evening and we were like what is it what you have in the suitcase and he's like okay this isn't a toy this is for me I got it for myself because I really really like it and he took out a pink foam pig and we were like oh cool a toy and he was like this isn't a toy was it your dad's sex pig <laughs> No, <laughs> why is that the first fucking place you go? Well, that if is if you, take, if you take a rubber, your, your secret rubber pig out foam. of a, a foam okay, pig, you and say, you're like you can children. say secret rubber pig and use quotation marks. My mind still doesn't go to sex pig. In fact, my mind has to travel a tremendous distance to go from sex to pig. Uh, <laughs> the only link would be that Black Mirror episode. I watched the new Always Sunny episode today. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay, yeah. so there's the link. But continue with the sex pick. This is because my dad is a man, isn't it? And you have an agenda. <laughs> so <laughs> sick of me pushing your fucking... What, what's the term? Misandrist? Is that it? All men are sex pigs. That's what she whispered to me before we started recording. <laughs> it was so random at the time, but it kind of makes sense now. Yeah. Uh, so he brings out this pig and he goes, Okay, quiet. And he turns on a switch and it starts going. <laughs> but there's a jingle. <laughs> and it starts wandering around the floor and it backflips. Whoa. And we're like, this is amazing. That's way better than having sex with it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but why weren't you allowed to touch it as the kids? Because they'll fucking ruin it because they're shitty kids. Yeah. And I was like. Can I play with it? And he, my dad was like, no. And Absolutely he, not. And he took it away. And um, maybe like a couple times a year, we would beg and beg and he would turn on the pig and it would go around the floor and play the song and oink and then backflip. And we were like, can you get us one next time you're in Spain or when you're you know, on holidays in continental Europe? And he was like, Maybe. I'll see. I got it from a man. I don't know if he's there anymore. And so, would you beg and sometimes he'd bring out the pig and sometimes he wouldn't? Oh, yeah. Was, That's such a good way to mess with kids. Was the pig kept in a separate room where you never saw it? It was in his wardrobe up in the top shelf uh, behind a bag, inside a bag. Like, that, must it was, have, that must have seemed like the most magical thing when you brought it out. Yeah. Did you Did you guys have ways that like you messed with other kids? Because I kind of did some stuff. I had two, I have three younger siblings, specifically two younger yeah, sisters. Siblings specifically, yeah, siblings. Yeah, you fuck yeah. with them. Because I remember this one time I was staying at like, uh, I think it was like my mom and dad were friends with another couple and like we'd go over for dinner and they were, they had like a young uh, little boy who was like a couple of years younger than me and I'd, I'd just fuck with him the whole time. How so? So, uh, one time, I can't remember what happened. I think we spilt some Coke or something and he was freaking out. He was like, oh no, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. And so... I was like, okay, Sean, listen. I was like nine, he was like seven. I was like, calm down. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to just explain to the adults what happens and I'm real good at smoothing this kind of stuff out. You won't get in trouble. So then I just stood out in the hall for like 40 seconds and I didn't do anything. And then I went back in and I was like, oh, they are really, really angry. They said they're going to take all your toys away. And he got really upset and he started crying and he was like okay Sean you know what I'm gonna go back in there and I'm gonna try and talk to them again and I'm gonna bargain them down to a lesser punishment because I think that's really severe and so I went out into the hall and I stood there for like 40 seconds again then I came back in and I was like I think I just made them matter and your dad says he's gonna put you in like a cage <laughs> <laughs> and it was about it was about an hour and a half of that until eventually one of the adults checked on us and they were like, Sean, what's what's wrong? Why are you crying? But at that point he was so upset that he couldn't really talk. And, you know, I feel like telling this story back, it makes me sound way worse than I was. Yeah, you sound like It makes a bully. you sound like a little psychopath and as well, the cola stain has only been staying longer. It could have been lifted out. Well, yeah, the cola stain was how I cash out, Neve. <laughs> So what awful stuff have you done, Neve? Yeah. Uh, Neve is 
easily the most the boldest person on this podcast yeah for sure I used to tell my little sister she had a very small scar on her arm and i told her it's because she had a conjoined twin and when they removed her she died <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that the ghost of the twin would kill her and then i'd put on a little voice and scare her every time the lights went off did you fuck with your brothers and sisters too much but you seem more protective um i set like home alone traps for them and shit like that i think i think i'm i don't know I was very young, and I might be misremembering it, but I might have accidentally sent my sister to the emergency room. How? I set a trap for another kid that was over that I didn't like. Can you set a trap? Are you digging a hole? You no. Set a trap. I set a home alone trap, so that's toy cars and a stairs. What the fuck, Brian? You and the wrong it. kid fell down and had to get a stitch in the back of his... It was my sister, I think. Now, I don't know if I made this up or not, so... I, I, I can't, and I don't want to ask my parents to confirm whether it happened or not, because we need to move on from this, and that's just how it is. I think what would happen is that on my dad's side, I'm the youngest of six boys, and so I had to put up with a lot of bullshit, and whenever I'd find a child more vulnerable than me, I'd be like, it's fucking payback time. It's definitely a situation, like because like... We're not only children, but we're uh, the eldest. Mm. So when you go to someone else's house and their friend has older kids, you're the one who gets picked on because you've no like frame of reference for whether they're fucking with you or not. Mm. So I definitely got fucked with too. Um, I was told Don Conroy at people's fingernails <laughs> and I believed it for years so Don Conroy is like the Irish version of Bob Ross yeah more or less yeah except he does children's caricatures he draws a lot of birds and like he's very cool yeah uh, I was a bit scared of him as a child I was never bullied by anyone's older siblings one of my older cousins used to dress up as a cat and beat the shit out of me <laughs> as if it met it better well they would they would, me out. They would yeah. say well they would be like they would be like oh john you better watch out this evening ronan's ronan's acting weird we think he's going to turn into the cat and i'd be like oh no oh no and then uh, at some point in the evening that would result in a vicious beating it's so i weird. think you know thinking back I think, I think that kind of messed me up a little bit I think all kids do that though where they kind of invent a persona to bully as or something mm -hmm. like it's like oh it's the evil Neve who's put you in the wash basket it's this my guy, this guy <laughs> had like but okay he had a cat mask and a cat tail okay he's a furry <laughs> and a psychopath he's figuring himself uh, out that, through what happens is that mean. how it all ended up like this you got the shit kicked out of me by a furry as a child yeah that, guess, that sounds I like guess, something that would happen to you yeah I guess so well what a world we live in. Welcome to Let's Fight a Boss, the world's strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two icons. Of the burnt furry community. To my right, we have Galloping Through the Sand. Her main ablaze, it's Hooves Neve. Hello. <laughs> like, I don't know what you want to do. To my do, left, but... you will find him in the deepest jungles of the Serengeti. A mass, a mass of scales and teeth, it's the crocodile. Brian. What's good? That's good. Guys, I watched a real fucking bad movie. <laughs> like an actual bad movie or a fun bad movie? The line with this one is so blurred, I'm not sure. Okay. I just know that I would nearly be 100% that you would both hate it. <laughs> Sweet. It's on Netflix. It's called The Ninth Life of Louis Drax. That sounds like a... That's a terrible name. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you ever watch a movie and it's like, there's a child in the movie, and the child, it's like, but it's not a children's movie, but the kind of movie sort of revolves around this child, and you're meant to think this kid's amazing, and like, it's, he's, they're really smart, and they're more, they're, you know, they're wise beyond their years and all that. This has the worst version of that I've ever fucking seen in this little shit heel child. 
that everyone loves. It's got Aaron Paul in it. Sweet. It's got Jamie Dornan in it. Aaron Paul is trying so hard, and I don't think he knows what he is. Jamie Dornan's like, he's not great. He's not in anything good. The Apart fall. from the hey, fall, the fall, he's but that's so fucking hot, fucking no. amazing. Oh, you're so fall. weird. No, like no, that's true. When he first, when he takes his mask off in the fall in the first scene, Michelle and she never says stuff like that. She was like, "That's a good looking serial killer." But Michelle likes serial killers, so <laughs> well, that's Michelle's damage. But uh, <laughs> but like just generally as an actor, I don't think he's good. And in the fall, I think it worked because he just had to be kind of silent most of the time and just stand there and look kind of sexy. I can see that. I can see that. There's a bit in this film where, oh, it's such a stupid fucking movie. There's a bit where Jamie Dornan is like channeling a small child through his body like a psychic link. Is this a, is this a, a sci-fi movie or is it a horror? I have no fucking idea. If you watch the trailer to this movie, it makes it look like a horror movie, which is how I ended up watching it. If you watch it, it is absolutely not a horror movie. It's like... So this is a fantastical movie. Thriller? Imagine someone saw Pan's Labyrinth and was then hit by a car and was in a coma (laughs) for nine years and had a bunch of crazy coma fantasies and woke up and then tried to make Pan's Labyrinth from memory. (laughs) That's what... There's a seaweed monster. (laughs) There's a twist in it that's really bad. It makes some really awful statements about victims of abuse and it's just it is awful it is just awful and the kid is the fucking worst we're meant to think this kid's amazing we're meant to think he's like this super precocious kid that says all these things that you know kids shouldn't say so he'll sometimes be like that man wants to do the sex with you talking to his mom (laughs) He's so perceptive. He's so perceptive. He's so precocious. It's such a wonderful movie about life. But it's not actually about anything. The kid, like, straight up murders animals in the film. And it's kind of played off like, what a quirky thing to do. Oh, okay. What does he murder? Like a A hamster. Hey! And it's established that he murders multiple hamsters. Uh, that's really mean. Nah, you shouldn't shouldn't fucking do that. And you sure as shit shouldn't do that and then be like, isn't this kid great? Because he ain't. Hamsters are just trying to mind their own. That's awful. Does it ever criticize the kid? Does it ever get to a point where it's just like, maybe the kid's fucked up? Well, like, they they kind of... Yeah, they go into that a bit, and they go, Mm. like, why he's fucked up. But he's also, like, every adult in the movie is like, he's the most amazing person I've ever met. I don't... He's extraordinary. In that exact tone. He's a spectacular child. (laughs) (laughs) What a wonderful boy. I, 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 I totally know exactly what, like fucking like feeling they're going for with this film yeah you get it like i bet you can hear the fucking music oh yeah 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 yeah. um i don't want to recommend this movie to anyone but like what i will say is like i i don't know it's like i've never seen something this bad in this particular way okay john does this take place in like a new york rich upper apartment kind of boy does it okay how many spiral staircases are in this film multiple I yeah no you get it no I don't fuck this shit would you watch this bro oh yeah okay cause cause I I, I guarantee I can make a drinking game out of this fucking thing cause Michelle was like are are, are you gonna talk to Brian about it and cause we're about like if anyone we know has seen this movie it'll be Brian I haven't seen this movie and I'm pissed off that I haven't like I need to I need to know it's on Netflix and it fucking sucks I'm watching it tomorrow morning fuck that shit (laughs) oh it's bad Neve. yes you watched Batman Ninja I sure did that's great boy is it it's really fantastic Mm -hmm. I was really surprised Um, just because I haven't it's Batman it's ninjas you would presume there would be a lot of hype over it but I generally haven't seen a lot of people talk about it um which I found really strange. It's all done uh, 3D animated by the same studio that does uh, Pop Team Epic. Kamikaze Doga is the studio They did the name. Jojo OPs as well. Oh, cool. They Brand. know how to use 3D really yeah. well. And they don't, and make it look they don't try and force 3D to being 2D. They just... It's no. just 3D. And they use it as a medium where they will play with it. There's like three different moments in Batman Ninja where they 
changed the animation style. There's one significant one where it changes to 2D and it's boiling and everything. Oh, it's so good. But they change it to like denote mental states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like it's a fantastic use of animation that like you you don't think you would see with 3D. And like the bit they're de- and like it's kind of it's it's a bit of a spoiler, so I don't want to talk about it. But the bit they're depicting with the switch to 2D. It's meant to feel really wrong because mm-hmm. you're seeing these very established characters in a totally different setting, and it really worked. I thought um, the story is 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 interesting. So Gorilla Groot, he's a Batman character. He makes a time traveling dev- device that sets all the Batman heroes and villains back to feudal Japan. Batman is the last person to arrive because he was kind of at the end of the shockwave. So he arrives two years later, and they've established themselves yeah, yeah they're basically the feudal lords across japan now so it's like two-face poison ivy penguin and joker <laughs> they're all and shoguns Deathstroke of different well. different yes, regions exactly okay it is fantastic and it hypes up in the most amazing way and all these characters are in it and like a lot of them don't get a lot of screen time but they don't feel underused no like it it just gets insane, and you're in la- you're along with the ride all the time. Uh, there's mechs in it. There is mega sword style yep. mech use. Yeah. There is giant monkey creatures. Uh, there is formed from smaller monkeys. Small formed by smaller monkeys. Batman is really interestingly written in it uh, so was joker i think it might be my favorite depiction of joker in any batman media ever the animation on him is gorgeous he kind of reminds me of kefka from final fantasy uh, 6 i thought they were like, walked a really fine line between like him being really silly and entertaining while still being like a, a viable threat to batman oh yeah like he has like samurai at his disposable as disposal and he seems dangerous and he's clever and it's such a well-paced movie where you get the kind of the core of Batman and Joker's relationship, but you know how they're kind of each other's yin and yang, how they only exist to nearly be with each other. Mm. They even get that complexity of their relationship across in like a few lines of dialogue. Yeah, and they do it amongst some of like the most insane, spectacular shit as well. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic. Yeah. It's one of the best Batman things I've watched in a really long time and i recommend it to everyone who's interested in batman and just good animation as well i think like it is easy to be like oh, another batman spin-off thing but this is totally just stand on its own really entertaining mm-hmm. just great the batman series gets the best adaptations yeah. um i really like lego batman as well from last year it's just like because he's so recognizable and his complexities are so easy to digest to 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 uh to un- understand and digest at the same time, yeah, and you can paint a different picture with each mm-hmm. with each kind of story. Even some of the older stuff, like do you remember the Arkham Knight shorts? They were a lot of fun. That was yeah. just a DVD that released with six shorts, and they were cool. Yeah, and they were done by different anime studios. Mm-hmm. One was done on like a Tekken King Creed mm-hmm. style yeah. by Production IG, I think. And then that that Wolf Smoke Studios short, Batman of Shanghai, that was really cool too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you're going to watch this, make sure you watch the subs. And not the dub. The dub was done without the script, and it can it's it's obvious. The story it becomes about Batman himself, like really about him kind of an old Thundercats thing of him learning a lesson. Yeah, you know, yeah, about power humility. Fantasy. You know, it's just like it's really fucking boring. And they add really stupid dialogue that isn't in the Japanese version. For example, there's a fight between Harley Quinn and Catwoman, and it's a silent fight. In the dub, the Catwoman said, like, I think it's Harley or Catwoman says, time for some girl-on-girl action. You know, it's just like they'll throw in stupid fucking Western bullshit lines that aren't even in it for no reason that ruins all the tension and is shitty and sexist and pointless. You know, it's like, why is that there? That's LGBT inclusion, Neve. I'll have you know. I'm waving the smallest <laughs> LGBT flag. Um... Only girls can fight each other. Oh, man, I hate that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, I, it's, I like I like seeing everyone fight everyone. Mm-hmm. Like you know, you know when they show all the bad guys and all the good guys, and you're like, who's gonna fight who? And it's like they always pair off the two girls of fighting them. I, in the... I hate that. I love it when it's like it ends up being like guys versus girls because like oh fuck, yeah, a lesser explored dynamic. No, I really like Usopp versus Perona for that reason. That's such a good Cause, fight because you think Nami in One Piece is gonna fight her, but like no, no, Usopp's yeah. gonna do it because 
But there, there's a better dynamic. Yeah, like, and fuck that. Yeah, I watched the dub of Batman Ninja, and um, it was definitely like the script was not my favorite part of it like i liked the spectacle i love how it looked and everything but it was just a very standard story mm-hmm. and so i think i might go back and rewatch it with the sub at some point it's worth it there's a lot of stuff flavor stuff um taken out like there's a big conversation about tea leaves and just drinking tea and like because alfred gets sent back as well and he's serving like bruce tea in feudal japan now Aww. that is all cut from the dub like that conversation is entirely gone and it's such a nice little way to flesh out the world as well as those characters and their mm. relationship with each other and they're just like that's not important but the girl and girl action line we'll, we'll put that in you know that'll be good uh so definitely watch the sub of batman ninja yeah that friend yeah okay i, I will i'm gonna watch it by the end of the year i promise mm-hmm. got a long half flight coming up and i need media to consume mm-hmm. trust me but one piece of media you cannot consume is jurassic park the for what is it jurassic world the- fallen kingdom this is the second installment of the Jurassic World reboot franchise. Okay. Uh, the first one was in summer 2015. It's this, one of my least favorite movies I've ever yeah, seen I, in the cinema. I do, I'm so glad I never saw it in the cinema. I would have wanted my money back. I fucking hated that movie. As do I. This is more of the same. Um, so, so before I get into this movie, they've already announced Jurassic World 3. It's out July 10th, 2021. Like, That's who gives a shit? Far away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, there's a three year gap between all of these movies because it takes them three, three weeks to write it and then about. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's VFX. Okay. I heard nothing good about this film <laughs> in the sense that even, like, people who aren't, like, cinema snobs or anything like that, like, like real fucking, like, Joe Normo was kind of like, that wasn't a very intelligent film. Like, this and it's true um it's not a good film but i'm gonna push all that aside i'm gonna say some nice things about this movie because i, I like the, it, it does have some good stuff okay it's very different to the other Jurassic park movies um they try something different uh, the first hour is on the Jurassic world island where a volcano is going to destroy all the dinosaurs and they managed to get a few of them off the island but it's done by a mercenary group that are going to auction them off to the highest bidders and all the highest bidders are like fucking war people who are going to use the dinosaurs well some of them are collectors i don't know this the second half of the movie all takes place in a fucking mansion in northern california and it may as well be the resident evil mansion like that's literally all it is that's cool i love mansions in films i think they're really fun when they yeah. get to be trash yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah now like this mansion they go all out it has an underground cloning lab like <laughs> like way down by a like a secret elevator that is very resident Evil. Yeah yeah, yeah 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 um and i was like do you know what all right yeah uh, like that that's different yeah um, i'd like to see like raptors running around a mansion okay there's a stupid annoying kid in this film as well. Thank God. And guess what? She learned, she finds out she's a clone. This is Resident Evil. Is she yeah. called the Red Queen? <laughs> no, it's it, like it's it's heavily implied she's a clone. They keep going like you really remind me. You rem- really remind me of the like because like you know how uh, uh, R- R- Richard Attenborough was in the original movies, but he's like canonically dead. Well, like he's also dead in real life. Rest mm. in peace, Richard. Like he was fucking amazing, but like he 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 had uh, died between the second and third movie. But James Cromwell, who's in loads of stuff, plays like his business partner who cloned a human. Because, you know, they're into cloning anyway, so why wouldn't they clone a human? So the little girl is the clone of this man? No, 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 of like someone's dead daughter. Oh, okay, because I was like, it'd be really weird to keep telling this young girl, you know, you really remind me of someone as just a cut to her smoking a cigar or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, but then like the end of this movie has this real life deserves a chance message. And it's the whole idea that like, these dinosaurs, maybe they don't deserve to live because they've already had their time on Earth. But the little clone girl goes, hey now, they get to live. Because I got to live. What the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, Jeff Goldblum is at the start and end of this movie, like during like a court hearing about the government wondering should they intervene with this like dinosaur island and the volcano, volcano about to explode. And like, you could tell Jeff Goldblum only showed up for half a day, did all his filming and took a check. Like, there, there is very little care. And, like, Chris Pratt's back in it, and so is Bryce Dallas Howard. 
they're fine. Their chemistry is as flaccid as it was in the previous movie. Yeah, that, that last one really put me off. Chris I heard Pratt. that she was meant to be a lesbian, but they cut the scene. Yeah, I, I could see that. Her character design is way better now. I really fucking hate her character design in the last movie because she was meant to look like Richard Attenborough's character where she was all in white mm-hmm. and she was a park manager, but she had this weird like Anna Wintour hairstyle. Yeah, and, and more high, heels and all the heel, time. Yeah. High heels, and it just didn't make sense. So now she's just dressed like an adventurer. Like she's just wearing like... She's just like a Tomb Raider looking person. And then like the new dinosaur for this movie is like a hybrid velociraptor that is part DNA of everyone's favorite velociraptor blue and then the mutant dinosaur from the previous film. Was that the from the last Jurassic World movie? Yeah. That thing sucked. This is better cuz it's cuz it's like a, it, it's like a slightly scaled up velociraptor and it has a great scene like they're not great scenes, they're just good set pieces, let's say. Where like the little girl is hiding underneath a bed, or, or or she's hiding in the bed with the blanket over her, and the velociraptors in her room, and it's like claws are right up against the bed, underneath, right up against the duvet, and like I think if you were a little kid watching this movie, that would scare the shit out of you, and when you were in bed that night, you might think there might be a dinosaur could break into your room, and so that was kind of like a good visual motif because like. It took the dinosaurs off the island, but it didn't, like, it sort of put them in the suburbs, but it put them in, like, a domestic environment that made it way, way creepier. What would you do if a velociraptor broke into your room at night and tried to sell you drugs? I'd buy the drugs. Buy the drugs, yeah. Yeah, you have to buy the drugs. What if it's, like, a bad drug, like heroin? Do the drug. Yeah, shoot it up, Johnny. I mean, it's only one night. (laughs) Let's get freaky. Yeah. Get freaky with a dinosaur, John. That's he's not. I, he's not gonna get high. He doesn't get high in his own supply. He's a man of business. Well, I'm taking or woman. Yeah, we, yeah, we don't know. No, we don't know. Actually, all the dinosaurs are female. Yeah, so it's a woman. Okay. Uh, I would take her drugs, and I would put them on my body. I think I'd probably try and negotiate. I don't want. I don't want to do heroin. Okay. There's this other bit, like in the first half of the movie, where Chris Pratt's character gets tranquilized, and Does like a dinosaur selling drugs. <laughs> no, but. This, you, you, you know you know how Chris Pratt's like funny in Parks and Rec yeah so they were like can you be like Andy Dwyer for like a little bit and so what they do is they have him so he's been shot by a tranquilizer but they take out the dart so only a little bit got into his system but it but like it leaves enough that it knocks him out for like a tiny bit but then uh, like a triceratops a, 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 a triceratops comes along and licks him awake like just licks his face and then he wakes up sure and then he notices that there's like magma like slowly coming towards him because the volcano has erupted and he has to like he's all drugged up so he has to like wake up his legs and then wake up his arms and he has to like goofily like roll away and like jump over like a fallen tree branch and like the lava is like literally touching him but he's not like on fire it's it's fucking ridiculous what's your favorite dinosaur brian um velociraptor I just think they're really fucking cool, but I don't like what they've become. I don't like what these movies have done to them. No, like <laughs> not one bit. In this one, the the one blue, they're like she she understands empathy. Take she's the fuck off. she's the second smartest creature on this planet after humans. People like dinosaurs because they're dinosaurs. Yeah, not because it could have the capacity to be human like. Mm-hmm. It's like it, they look cool. Hmm. Yeah, like I. I really like the original Velociraptors. Like, I, I still think my favorite is the first movie, and the Velociraptors in that kitchen scene are Dude, this, fucking I think amazing. None of the films after that are great, are they? Lost World has some good bits. It also has some dumb bits. Yeah. Like a girl uses gymnastics to fight Velociraptors. I remember that bit. And it has a badly written scene where somehow there's a T Rex in San Diego. I think that's where the boat pulls up, and it eats a dog. And then they get rid of the T Rex. I that 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 film is yeah they're they're messy films. Yeah, Hollywood. Chris Pratt is just one of these guys that I started out thinking he's a cool, funny guy, and the more stuff he's in, and the more I learn about him as a person, like how he's super religious and just tweets Bible verses. I saw that with the Guardians of the Galaxy stuff. He yeah. was like, I need some time to pray. It's like. <laughs> he's 
he he he's definitely going to suffer from uh, like a lot of o- o- overexposure. Yeah, oh, I think he already has. I think that the yeah. charm of seeing Chris Pratt in the thing is gone completely. He really did not pick his roles well. I guess when someone comes knocking on your door and they're like Jurassic Park, you you're like okay. Well, yeah. put it this way, he probably made more money from that Jurassic Park movie than we and everyone who listens to this podcast will make in their entire lives but does that matter yeah money's great (laughs) he's probably made more money than the entire like team of seven seasons of parks and rec have i'd say so good for him yeah that creatively dead idiot (laughs) so a new season of always sunny in philadelphia started season 13 season 13 have we all watched episode one? Yep. Yes. Is that all that's out right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, okay. no, ep- ep- episode two is out later this week. Yeah. Um, I love this show. I thought this episode was great. It's always sunny. Everything felt as it should. I was happy. I didn't like the episode. Yeah. <gasps> really? It reminded me of the principal and the popper episode of The Simpsons where they just reset the status quo. I was just kind of disappointed by it like they, there was some good jokes in it some characters just stood around and did nothing like frank but it's a he, setup he does, he does that a lot though yeah, yeah. like yeah. i mean he, danny like, devito's not a with young with the man. principal and the pauper i think the problem wasn't the resetting of the status quo the problem was it actively broke principal skinner as a character yeah that's true i i i, I was just very underwhelmed i did really like that mac fucking worked out my god that guy is caught like what the fuck? How? And he's just showing it off. He looks great. He you looks could cook great. a steak on that chest. Yeah, yeah, you could. I I don't know. I thought it was really funny. I loved all the stuff with the Dennis sex doll. That mm-hmm. really made me laugh. That was that really looked like Dennis, but in such an uncanny, weird way. To the point that, like, at the end, can we spoil this? Not really. I don't know. I don't know. It's a TV show. It's been out a week. Yeah. Can okay. you spoil Always Sunny? It's just a 22 minute TV show. Dennis like, like shows up at the end, real Dennis. Mm-hmm. And because you've been looking at the doll for so long, he looks really freaky yeah. himself. Like he, I know Dennis is kind of a serial killer character, but he's starting to look like a serial killer. Yep. <laughs> he know? looked like a candle. Yeah, he, he like, looked so smooth. <laughs> yeah, he was weird and waxy and shiny. I, I just thought everyone, I loved uh, at the start. When Charlie was like, oh, Mac, he's skinny, he's big, he's fit, it doesn't matter, you look great, Mac. Like, it was just odd, fucking, it killed me. Like, I I had a blast start to finish. And Mindy Calling was the the guest this episode as, like, the new member of the gang. Yeah. She she was pretty good. Yeah, I thought she was great. I really liked her on Twitter beforehand being like, "Uh, yeah, everyone just to confirm I'm replacing Dennis for the 13th season of Always Sunny. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. I hope she shows up again. I want her to team up with the McPiles or something and destroy them. Oh, that'd be good. I'm really happy it's back. I fucking love that show. And with that, let's move into Strategy Talk. Okay, I've been playing a bunch of stuff. Um, and so I'm going to kick things off here and talk about The Messenger. Have you guys heard of this game? No. I have. It's a pixel game. Yeah. So this is like a kind of old school pixel game. And um, it's, a bit, it's a bit weird because like there's a twist in this game. But the twist is everywhere. And every podcast has been talking about it. And the twist is also in the trailer. Right. So I guess if you're just about to play the messenger and you don't want to know this twist, may, I guess it will include a time code. Yeah, yeah, just skip skip ahead fifteen seconds. What's the twist? Quick, do it quick. I I need no. Is I got I got I got a whole I got to build up to it. Okay, skip mm, since it's John fifteen minutes. Yeah, that's so mean. <laughs> you guys are such assholes. God, I hate this fucking podcast. <laughs> um, that's so great. you start off and it's pretty much like a throwback to like pretty much Ninja Gaiden Nintendo stuff. You know, like that era of game. And um, you're a ninja, your clan gets wiped out, you get handed a message to bring to the top of a mountain, and um, you it, it's relying on a lot of like kind of retro charm, that kind of stuff. The dialogue's very self-aware, it's very uh, 
knows it's a video game and is acknowledging it and that kind of stuff. Like they'll make jokes about dialogue boxes and things like that. There's a really interesting mechanic called cloud stepping. So if you hit an enemy or a projectile or anything, you can then do a jo double jump off that. So you're in the air, you hit an enemy, you can do another double jump to go higher. And as long as you keep hitting enemies, you can do that. Then it's got a grappling hook and all this kind of traversal mechanic. And this game has been like, it has been getting a lot of tens. Like people fucking really, really like this game. And I'm kind of baffled because after about, I'd say six or seven hours with it, I kind of fucking hate it. Really? Yeah. The twist is in, like, the twist is cute, okay? You get to a certain point and you go forward in time. Mm -hmm. And so then, instead of it being, like, an 8-bit game, like, an, on the Nintendo, it's a 16-bit game, like, a Super Nintendo. And both versions look really nice. The pixel art is really good. My problem is I think the game design fucking sucks. I think the levels are really, really boring. And... It's not, there. It, like most of the game is very easy, but then when the game gets like challenging, it spikes to get really challenging, but it's challenging in a really frustrating way. Like there's one level and all of a sudden there's all these laser pillars that show up. And if you touch the laser pillars, you're dead. The problem is like, you have to wait for a lot of platforms to kind of like, you know, float along so you can walk under them to block the laser pillars or like jump across them. But if you die, you'll be sent back like four screens and you'll have to do the same like puzzles that involve waiting for these things to go. And it's just, it's very frustrating. And then like the comment, like it really hinges on, hey, this is a retro game. You know, like the, like, like someone will be like, wow, I just said so much that, you know, I need, I, barely had enough room in the dialogue box and it's just so like i feel like that kind of humor in games was played out like five years ago i think it can like it can still work if it's subtle but if it's constant it's kind of if that's what you're hinging it on it's kind of like eh. i think it needs to be subtle or it needs to completely shatter the reality mm -hmm. of the game yeah it's like, like bastion but like it's not doing anything yeah like if if a game is going to break the fourth wall do it like mother three like fucking destroy it mm -hmm. but this is just kind of constantly like hinting at it in a little way and i found it really i the comedy felt so flat for me and then like i'm constantly playing this game and i'm like man has no one have people checked out curse of the moon the Bloodstained, this prequel to that, because that game is so well designed and so tight, and like all the levels are constructed around the abilities of your characters, and it's so satisfying. But with this, like, there's so many stretches where it's just like, oh, okay, yeah, I see what I gotta do, and I go and do it, and like it's really, I can tell, like, you know, there's there's obviously an affection for retro style games here, but the design of the game does not back it up, and I think. I'm really surprised this game has gotten the attention it has. Like, really, really surprised. I think it it does one of my absolute least favorite things that game do games do, which is like it is relying on retro charm and nostalgia. I don't think it's actively doing anything. You have like like Mega Man Two is an infinitely better game, and that game came out like what thirty years ago, and it's like it doesn't do anything to really push things forward, and it's not better than the things that are already out, and it's kind of like. I just, I fail to see the charm of this game. Does it flick between the two styles often or does it just happen the one time? I think, uh, so I've just hit the style thing and basically what happens then, it goes from like a 2D side scroller into a Metroidvania. Okay. But I'm like, this did not impress me. Is it? And like, I was mainly playing through the game because I wanted to see the twist. And now that I've seen it, like I am so unenamored. I think I'm just going to put it down. Like I think it might be done. If people think that there's going to be stuff to turn me on this game, I'd like to hear about it, but it also became to stress I have not enjoyed the game enough at all up until now. And so it would have to get, like, like the game design behind this game would have to get so much better for me to care about it. Not where I thought that was going. That's a, that's disappointing to hear. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was really sold on it because I'd heard so much about it, but I, I really, it felt so flat for me it's nearly like hype culture ignores a lot of problems with the game mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 
Oh dear. Like it feels like the it feels like this game is constantly like standing beside me and elbowing me in the ribs and being like, "Remember Ninja Gaiden? Do you remember do you remember Ninja Gaiden? Wouldn't wouldn't it be funny if someone did a parody in Ninja Gaiden? Like that's mm-hmm. that's what it feels like and it's not funny enough for that to work and it's not interesting enough for any other aspect of it to work for me at least. So yeah, wanted to get that out of the way. Big thumbs down for me. Um I played that Curse of the Blood Moon thing. Oh yeah? Yeah, I love it. It's great. Fucking fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. I I feel like that's one of that's some of the best art direction I've seen in an 8-bit game where like it just it's so beautiful and mm-hmm. sparse and like there's no regular enemies. Every enemy in that game looks like something fucking weird I've never seen before. It's really cool. I was playing it a lot on the plane and I kept showing Rebecca like boss monsters every time I got so to a boss. Awesome, I was just right? like, check out this boss. Yeah. Um, all the boss battles feel cool. I think that's uh, a big surprise because I don't usually like those games and I don't feel like I can manage those games. Like, I'm not particularly good at them, but this one has made me want to. And I like that there's so many, because of the four characters and their different abilities, mm. I feel like I have a lot more to work with with it. So a Let's Fight a Boss fan got in touch with me. You know, you don't have to take the characters with you. At all? You can kill the characters. Why would I do that? <laughs> because they grant you a new ability. Oh, really? So all of a sudden you get a completely separate ability for your main character and you can play through the game like that and it leads to an alternate ending. Okay. Which is completely separate because something's going to happen when you finish the game that really made me want to play through the game again that leads to a completely different ending. So there's at least three paths through that game. That's fascinating. And the fact that every level has been designed to account for that like, that is an amazing game, and I only get mm. more fond of it the further away from it I get. I'm really happy you're enjoying it. Yeah. Man, I totally would go back and kill that old man. I do not care about him at all. I love Whip Girl. She's good. She's amazing, and she's the star of Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm um, really excited to play that now. The old man sucks, except when he's great, because some of his spells are so strong. That ice arrow thing? Yeah. That's, that's really good. And, um, like, that game just blew me away, and... Compared to that, the messenger just feels so tired for me. Like, just the amount of times I sighed playing that game. I'm really glad you're playing uh, Curse of the Moon. That's a fantastic game. So it's worked out. The messenger, nobody wants it. Here, we want Curse of the Moon. Yep. Brian. Yeah. You've been saying, you've been playing one of the biggest games of 2018. Please tell us about Goof Troop. Goof Troop. Ba-da-da, yeah. Um, I'm playing Goof Troop on the Super Nintendo. I modded my SNES Mini to have more games on it, and I decided to put Goof Troop on it because you can't play this game any other way. That's, I, I love this game. Yeah. This is fucking amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing game. This is made by Capcom in 1993. It was designed by Shinji Mikami, the creator of Resident Evil. What? I didn't know that! Okay, so, the DNA of Resident Evil is in this game. Oh my god, you're so right! Okay, so you play as Max and Goofy from Goof Troop, and you're stranded on a desert island, and it's broken into like five or six levels. And it's a top-down, tile-by-tile Zelda kind of look-alike. And you don't have any uh, attack buttons, but rather you pick up items and you solve puzzles in rooms. And the enemies are just pirates and kind of uh, like evil frogs and snakes and stuff you'd find on a desert island or, you know, like on a kind of dangerous island, I guess. But there is so much puzzle solving, but it's all like you're 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 in a room and you need to drop an item to pick up a new item. Oh, wow. And... You need to, like, get across a gap using a grappling hook, and then you pick up a key to unlock a door. Does this sound like Resident Evil? Yeah. Just there's without the zombies. Of, there's a lot of block puzzles, but I remember them being actually pretty cool. They're really, really good, and the co-op of this game is amazing. I'm yeah. playing with my friend Steven at work, and uh, to us it's a new game, but it's it, it, it's completely playable in 2018. Like The game's 25 years old. A lot of those games, like, you kind of have to go read a walkthrough online to solve the puzzles. But with this, like, the game is so well designed. Because it's made by Shinji Mikami. Yeah. And the boss encounters were really cool. Yeah. Um, 
this is one of the like this is one of the coolest games I've ever played, and I was not expecting this yeah, to be what it is. Yeah, total hidden gem. Yeah, and so Shinji Mikami designed this game tr- two or three years later, made Resident Evil, and the game philosophy is in both of those games. It is just it flows so well. Um, it's it, it, it's probably only going to take me about two or three hours to beat. I'm about an hour and a half in. I've got like one or two levels left. I remember when I was little, I used to sit down and beat it in a day. Yeah. So, yeah. It's really... But, like, it's so satisfying, and it has all these uh-huh moments when you solve a puzzle. But, like, they're all in. Like, it, like and, and to me, some, some of the puzzles can... Like, especially when you're pushing blocks to fall into, like, tile... Like, little star mark style, tiles. Like, that's all over, like, the Pokemon Red and Blue and Gold and Silver games as well. Where, you're, 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 like, it, it, it does feel like a top-down... Yeah puzzle solver and like Max and Goofy each have their own abilities where like Goofy has like damage and a half and then Max has speed and a half so Max, and the speed really matters because yeah. like the enemies will fuck you up especially with co-op because like Max can run to a next door and it'll teleport both of you to the door Yeah. but then if you go back into the room the room resets Yeah. and all the enemies are there again and you have to kill them off again like very very similar like all it's missing are the zombies yeah Super, super, like, not even underrated, just no one talks about it. Yeah, uh, a very, very important game, and yeah. I can't wait to play uh, the next Resident Evil remake in January. Like, this has me psyched. Yeah. Speaking of me, remakes, I've been playing Yakuza Kiwami 2. This is the second Yakuza game remade for the PS4, and um, I won't go on about it too much because people have heard me talk about, like, uh, Yakuza games and whatnot, but um, it's cool, it's Yakuza. Like, it is another Yakuza. What I would say about this one, and I've heard a lot about the second game. It's a real fan favorite. And I really like it. Like, I've been having a great time with it. But what I would say is, like, this is definitely a game that is less personal to Kiryu. Um, So it's like, you pretty much start the game and Yakuza hijinks kick off nearly instantly. And so it's much less about Kiryu as much as it is Kiryu kind of getting caught in another, caught in the cogs of another giant Yakuza problem, which he punches his way through. And I do, I think after experiencing Six, I do kind of miss that much more personal aspect of it. Cause he's, even though like he's left the Yakuza, he's not really burnt out on the Yakuza anymore. Like he's very ready to get back involved. And I think what I enjoy about Kiryu so much is him later on in the series when he's really struggling between trying to lead a normal life and beginning Yakuza and I feel like that's really absent from the game like pretty much a Yakuza person gets shot and right away his daughter's like oh I'll just go stay in the orphanage for a while and he's like cool and that's it and then the rest of it is you know pretty typical Yakuza fare and now it's a lot of fun there's a lot of polish in some of the cutscenes. In other places, I think you can really feel the remnants of it being a PlayStation 2 game. There's some design where it's like, you walk into a new town, there's a waypoint to go to a bar, you have no reason to go to the bar, you go, the cutscene triggers, and that's kind of it. You know what I mean? But um, it's Yakuza, and I'm enjoying it. And super, super quick, I, I had two sick days last week, so I played a lot of games. Um, for some reason, I started playing Devil May Cry 3 again. Nice. Yeah. Is this uh, remastered? Yes. So I think in one of the very early episodes of the boss cast, I talked about how I was playing Devil May Cry 3 on the PlayStation 2. I actually had a lot of trouble going back to that game because that game runs at 60 frames per second on a PlayStation 2, which is amazing. But I think the trade-off is it runs at like 360p. Like it looks like fucking muck on a PlayStation. And so I, I think I, I needed to capture some footage for this for a thing. And so I started playing it. And I just needed an hour or two of footage, but I ended up playing like four hours. And Devil May Cry 3 is so much fun. It's really, really good. It's so goofy. This is the one with the younger, yeah, jokey. Pizza. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and he, like he's not taking the situation seriously at all. He's not, but he's also trying to be cool and it's not working out for him. And it's really funny. And there's a bit where like there's this like jester character in it. And, like, Dante starts, like, shooting his feet to make, to, like, be like, hurry up and talk or whatever. But then the gesture starts doing, like, a really (laughs) stupid dance. And he starts running on the spot in a really silly way. And it's so silly and stupid, but it's backed up by this, like, 
unbelievably tight combat. Like the combat is so fun and so satisfying. Um, I'm going to beat it and I'll have more to talk about probably in a future episode. But just, yeah, to get it out there, playing that and it's it's been great. I'm sure Fox Kate is going to be horrified that I've never finished Devil May Cry 3, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Did you play 4? No. I played Devil May Cry 1, loved it, and then never went near the series again. Oh, really? Yeah. Wasn't Devil May Cry 1 like launch window for the PS2? Not quite launch window, a little bit out from that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, um... I, the trailer for that is so sick because it's like you see Dante walking along with the sword and then he like pulls out the guns and you're like oh my god swords and guns and then it goes oh my god <laughs> <laughs> whoa I, that was on like one of the you know Playstation 2 demo discs where like it wasn't a demo but it just had a bunch of cutscenes and I just would rewatch that over and over so yeah really cool the new one's looking amazing yeah, that looks that looks really really good. And playing this makes me remember why I liked the first one so much. It's so good, and like, oh, like there's so many ways you can approach it. But anyway, we got a bigger fish to fry, or spider to fry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people eat spiders. In that Indiana Jones film, they did. Yeah, they do. Uh, this is Marvel's. Spider-Man for I'm, PlayStation I'm 4. I'm very glad you added the Marvels onto the start of that because I really don't have to stop being correct. Mm-hmm. That's that's the official name of the game. Marvel's Spider-Man, Spider-Man for PlayStation 4. This is a PS4 exclusive and the fastest selling PS4 game. Ever. Wow, it must be amazing. Yeah. Um, sorry. So like me and Brian are both playing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Brian, what's your experience with it? I'm 49% true. I'm doing a lot of the side quests because I want to level up spider-man so he's better in combat situations it, like it, it's it's great it's it's fine um i don't <laughs> get the hype great and fine okay well i think this is like this is a big huge game and there's a lot of hype around it so what i think we should do is basically break it into what we think is good about the game and what we think is bad about the game so yeah. we'll start with the good yeah let's yeah. let's get posy <clears throat> okay do you want to go first yeah uh the good things i like about it are uh, it's eight years into Spider-Man's career. I was really surprised to hear that. And so there's no Uncle Ben origin stuff because I've seen that so many fucking times. Uh, Peter Parker is 23 and he is an intern for uh, Doctor Octavius. Oh, cool! That'll work out. Yeah, and um, I really, really like that. Um, the story. Um, I'm kind of into the story. I like it, just because. Um, it's not something I've seen in, like, the movies. Um, what else do I like about it? Combat, gameplay is amazing, and I love New York, so it's great to see, like, a pretty decent representation of New York. Like, it's more or less accurate to the real city, mm. and, like, the web slinging is cool. Sometimes it'll play a cutscene and it'll go seamlessly into, like, the gameplay, which is kind of neat. It's so polished. Yeah. Like, there's different voice recordings for if he is speaking a line and he's midair, so it's a strained, like, kind of recording. Or versus if he's just walking or standing still or static. Um, The stuff I like, environmental detail, I go on and on and on about environmental environments all the time. Spider-Man is so polished. You would go up to a fridge in Doc, Doc Ock's, like, lab, and if you go into photo mo- mode, you can read the little menu of all, like like a little restaurant menu. You can read all the dishes, all the prices. There's little photos. Once you drop onto the ground, like literally anywhere in this giant city of New York, you can drop down and there's signage, there's graffiti. You're like throwing these like manhole covers. If you go look at the manhole cover, it's a beautiful textured, realistic render of it. There's like stickers on like lamp, like lamp posts yeah. it's just so detailed like visually and textured yeah, like, like the prop yeah. design is insane there are collectibles in the game like there's one where you find a baseball ticket that you and uncle ben went to and it's the first time they mention uncle but uncle ben but it has like the date of like april 2010 and it's 2018 now so you kind of get like context and timeline for the the, the last eight years of his life A lot of, like, the world building is done through, like, the detail of the props, like, that kind of stuff. And, like, 
there's bits where you find, like Black Cat is like leaving you stuff across the city where you find it but like, she's really a whole fun. pile of like, like coffee cups around the place and like food and you can like zoom in on the food and it's all really beautifully rendered the lighting is gorgeous in this like, yeah it's a beautiful looking yeah, game like, I'd heard it was beautiful but even some of the stuff I've seen on Twitter it's like yeah I like I don't understand how that moves yeah. I like it's it's kind of fascinating to have that bigger world look that beautiful all the time like and there's no texture pop in that I've noticed no and like it never hitches it's like it performs really really well mm-hmm. I really 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 like the combat like I I like showing up to a like an enemy location and you and you're in stealth mode before you've been alerted so you can like sneak up above and it, like it is very similar to the Batman Arkham games where you can take them out one by one but then after a while they get alerted and then you have to go in and do like one-to-one combat with them and you're juggling because like they have guns you have to like shoot webs and disable them first and then from what from what i've seen like heard from a lot of it spider-man but the combat sounds very like vulnerable yeah oh yeah which i think is interesting because he's not a muscle head no Mm -hmm. and like this game does have like a light version of the detective mode but like you can't use it at all and like it's there, but you, you, you uh, don't need to use it. Because a lot of the fight encounters are during the daytime as well, which is a big advantage. And you can also change your outfit to be, like, bright white in inverted colors. So it's very easy to read. Like, the game is super accessible that way as well. Mm-hmm. And, you and like, it's got cinematics that have quick time events, but you can also just turn those off as well if that's not what you're into. Like, it, it's customizable. It has a lot of accessibility options yeah. for people who want to play that game. But I think that kind of like you like the combat a lot. I do not like the combat. Okay, are we entering the negatives? No, no, I'm not finished okay. with positives. I'm gonna run down yeah. my positives because I have a <laughs> list of here. Because like I don't want to bash this game because I don't think it deserves a bashing. The traversal, which is what kind of people cared about the web slinging, it is like it's gorgeous. It's perfect. Like yeah. you can pick up speed. The animation on Spider Man is fantastic. He'll do a tuck. Yeah. He'll do a roll. It all just like blends into each other. There's a really good sense of sense of speed and momentum. Like you really like feel it. Um, and the stuff where you can unlock, where like he can jump into a roll, and then if mm-hmm. you press, if you time X at the right time, he'll bounce out of a roll and just like pinball his way like a top rooftops. Did you guys ever hear the story? Do you remember the way that? PlayStation 2, Spider-Man 2 game had, like, the best swinging. Yeah. Do you ever hear the story of how that happens? No. No. The guy would sneak into the studio at night and program it himself. He pitched it to the team and they wouldn't, wouldn't listen to him. What? Really? And so he ended up programming all the stuff himself. Yeah, he ended up doing, like, a Kickstarter for a game with the same swinging mechanics. So he, like, snuck into the building and was changing code? Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. I don't know if he was changing code or, or just he building was building his, his own, his own version to be like, look, it's better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, it's got a good rule where like, let's say you jump off the Empire State Building. You have to fall like a couple seconds before you can web sling onto anything else because there's nothing to grab. There's nothing yeah. to grab. And like, they have built that into the mechanics and it's so good because otherwise you'd just be grabbing like air. invisible yeah. air. Yeah, yeah it and, would and, be mindless. And yeah. Spider-Man's web sling isn't mindless. And there are some missions where there's helicopters kind of like floating around. So you have to use them as like anchors mm. to mm-hmm. swing across, which is really, really cool. On the reverse of that, sometimes like there's a like you have to fly yourself through some smoke clouds and gather chemical stuff. Yeah, they suck. Sometimes they're not near any tall buildings, and you can be trying to launch yourself through those smoke clouds, and it doesn't register for ages. Mm-hmm. I was just like, man, why are you putting me where there's no buildings if you want me to sling? Uh, so traversal, really, 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 really good. It's what people wanted it to be. They achieved exactly what people wanted them to achieve with that. Environmental design, beautifully detailed, gorgeous looking game. Lighting is amazing. Combat, I'm mixed on. I think it gets repetitive, but it only gets repetitive because there isn't much to do in the world, but kind of stop random goons. Yeah. So this, you use the same combat outside of the main mission in the world and you've done like 10 little mini missions where you've beaten up random encounters sure it's kind of it just it's like you have a lot of it is it's one button like it's two buttons i guess your attack button and your block your dodge button yeah so after you do that for a long period of time it kind of gets monotonous a little bit the only way i kind of find them engaging is that they offer bonuses where it's like do two focus finishes Mm -hmm. on enemies or do mid-air combos on three or four of them and it'll, it'll reward you extra points so I try to go for them 
or I'll make a game in my head where I'm like, I, I can't take any damage this yeah. round. But you're adding extra challenge then. Like they like I get what you mean with the XP bonuses. I do them as well just yeah. to be like, okay, I'll try and get and my I'm, ten air launches kind and of I, thing. And I'm constantly doing stunts in the mm-hmm. air as well as I'm traversing around just to build up my XP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. I got that as well. And I was like, that's a good way to do it. And that for me is what's good about the game. Okay. Um, I don't particularly like, I don't mind the eight years in the future thing. Like, I think that's fine to do. I don't know if I like the story. I think it's kind of weird. What's like the, I haven't really heard like the premise of the okay. story. He's locked up most of the bad guys and they're in prison. Okay. And like, it's kind of at a calm period of his life. Like it's wound down and like it's wound down and he's just like helping out at a shelter and he's, and like, he's just doing petty crime. He's, he's stopping petty crimes. He's not yeah. stopping any main villains outside of the shocker at the beginning, but he's, pretty straightforward as a boss battle generally so what's like what is happening is like yeah it's kind of more peaceful but fisk the kingpin is there and spider-man takes fisk out and fisk is the crime lord so then there becomes a power vacuum so there's this race of different super villains to fill that space there's one kind of main and kind of antagonist group which is mr negative and his group of demons he's one of the newer villains from spider-man like he's only i think he's my mind might be totally wrong about this i think he only started appearing in the last couple of years in the comics yeah like i'm not sure when he appeared like um in the comics generally but i i think he's an interesting character they do a thing where he seems to my understanding of mr negative was his name is like is it martin lee yeah um, beforehand is that they they don't understand he doesn't understand that he's Mr. Negative like it's kind of like a Hulk thing like they've no concept oh. he's no conception that he's being Mr. Negative but in this he seems to know he's Mr. Negative yeah no he has like a secret identity yeah like he's leading a double life exactly but like from the comic version my my impression of him is that he didn't know he was these two split characters um what I don't like about this is Spider-Man is straight up a cop. He calls himself Spidey Cop. Maybe he's Spider-Man and Narc. Yeah, he's a fucking Narc. Fucking god damn it. No, I think this is the lamest fucking I will call the cops on you because you're smoking weed at a party version <laughs> of Peter Parker. Jesus, need one time. Ever. He has a working relationship with the NYPD. She caught like... like um, Yuki is your version of Oracle yeah. in this game compared Yuki, to the Batman games. Uh, yeah, Yuki... Uh, what Nabe? She's from the comics as well. Um, she plays another character as Wraith. Uh, uh, but she is now basically your Commissioner Gordon. She will give you emissions from the police. Spider-Man refers to himself as Spider-Cop. And she also says, like, later on when Sable comes and she kind of ties up Spider-Man, she's just like, he works with us. You get your, like, missions directly from her and the police station. Right. Which... I don't particularly like. Yeah, not my favourite version of Spider-Man either. Yeah, and, like, a lot of people like shit on say the assassin's creed games for being tower games you climb a tower you unlock an area and it's full of icons outside of the main narrative that is all this game is you like, unscramble scramble police signal jammers yeah. and then it throws up a bunch of dots on your map and it's like not it just was like really really disappointing to see that four towers it's like four towers per per area wow okay so you're like putting up police surveillance and there's not one moment like not even a little moment where peter's like hmm spying on people is bad like even in the batman movies where i think batman has to like hack into surveillance all oh, around yeah, the city they make, they make a real point that that's yeah, a bad thing to he, do he has a moment where he's like should i be doing this on uh, batman like people's privacy in this like spider-man's like don't worry i'll get those towers up for you we can spy on the people and i'll use that to like further my good agenda you know what i mean like it's just like oh well when he puts it like that yeah it's just like this is fine yeah. and there's no criticism to it there's no commentary about it and like i asked on twitter like because i was like really confused because i thought spider-man was kind of just treated generally as a vigilante and uh thanks for everyone who, f- who filled me in like he has generally a pretty good relationship with the nypd he will tie people up and leave them there for them but he's never worked for them in this he is basically a cop he is working for them but is not on the payroll He's a direct line to uh, Yuki, who is telling, giving him missions, you know, and like it kind of feels weird to 
set up a surveillance tower, then go down to the ground, beat up some goons and be like, okay, what next? And you're like, oh, okay. Uh, which then leads to the other kind of character writing in it. Um, like a lot of people have been talking about Jay Jameson, who is kind of this Alex Jones character yeah, in this. Yeah, he's, he's the editor of the Daily Bugle, but in this he's retired from the Daily Bugle and he has an internet radio show where he is anti-Spider-Man and pro-conspiracy and... It's optional that you can turn off all that stuff if you don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But throughout the game, Spider-Man listens to his radio show, doesn't comment on it, and it's supposed to be like, do you get it? Do you get who this is meant to be? That's like, from from what I've heard, that sounds fun. Is it? This, this it stops thing, being fun. Yeah. yeah, it's fun the first two, three I, I times you hear it. Every now and then I, I will go and watch some InfoWars highlights because Alec Jones, Alex Jones just fucking tickles me pink. Yeah, I think yeah. the comedy of Alex Jones is he's a real person. And I like just it, like, I, I like it whenever he rips off his shirt. <laughs> he's banned from Twitter now. So it's like, it's like, I don't even have a problem with him being this Alex Jones person. It's the fact that they're the, doing these one-to-one -one comparisons nearly because they kind of compare Fisk to Trump. Fisk has a building and it's called Fisk Tower and it's near where Trump Tower is in mm -hmm. real life. Huh. And, it's pretty on the nose. And like, I know the studio Insomniac, whenever the Me, uh, last year when the Me Too stuff started coming out, they 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 made a video with the entire staff with this with with the creative director in front just being like, we don't approve of this kind of behavior. This is, you know, we're 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 a hardworking studio and it's a productive, you know, respectful environment. Mm -hmm. And I know, and like, it's very easy to tell what, what, like, what way they're politically aligned, but they can only do so much in a AAA game where they want to sell to as many people as possible. And they're just wink, wink, nudge, nudge with this stuff. Does it feel maybe a little half-hearted? I think it's character assassination of Fisk. I think Fisk is a way more interesting and nuanced character than whatever Trump is. You know what I mean, and I think it's also not a big fan of the writing behind Trump personally. It's like it's like, like it's a pretty boring TV show. Yeah, this, like, I'm, I'm I'm not enjoying the last fucked. few seasons of this. thing. No, it's gone off the rails. Like but the whole thing about him becoming president. It's like come on. It's kind of weird because like Trump incompetent. Fisk is a mega genius crime lord. They're not a comparable kind of thing, and I think it really undervalues the concept of Fisk and him as a villain to Spider Man and to Daredevil to kind of compare him to Trump. Yeah, they're just dumbing him down to a greedy businessman who has his hands and yeah. Because really, I've, I've always, like eyes. one thing I always loved about Fisk is like his eloquence. Yeah, like how clever and just considered yeah. he is. He's so calm when out because because there is a bit at the, at the in the opening where you fight Fisk and he's just like. Spider-Man shows up in his office and he has all this fucking samurai shit in his office mm -hmm. and like he's just talking to Spider-Man but as he does it he walks behind bulletproof glass and you don't even realize he's done it until he did and you're like yeah that's pretty good but um I don't I don't like that comparison of him as Trump as well and it also gets weirder as the game progresses because then when the vacuum is created and the demons move in they're Martin Lee's group of Chinese men who are fighting um Peter starts saying stuff like well at least Fisk cared about New York and I'm like mm, mm, mm. if you're making this one to one comparison with Alex Jones, Trump but you're also pro police surveillance and like they're obviously interested in explore, exploring these topics but what are they going for yeah you kind of have the Bioshock infinite problem where it kind of starts to they start exploring it and then they double back and then they're like, well, maybe both sides are Yeah, right. they leave the room and the room's on fire and they're like, oh, we can do it. I guess fire is bad. Yeah, yeah and I think it's just this moment they were like, wouldn't it be clever if we thought that like Fisk was Trump and we called it Fisk Tower? And it's just like, well, the more and more you add on to it, the more and more this starts to say something or doesn't say something. And yeah. it's just like, why would you even make a comparison to these real life figures if it kind of brought you into these murky waters kind of thing? Yeah. And like, so that stuff is weird. But putting that shit aside and going back to say gameplay stuff, this game feels like to me, it's eight years old. Yeah. I, I would not be surprised that this game was in development for a long time because it uses like the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man visually a lot as a reference. Mm -hmm. Like Peter Parker looks like Andrew Garfield rather if he than had, like, like jaundice and was kind of sick and dying. <laughs> oh, yeah. I okay. think this Peter model looks terrible. I hate him. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of the characters have clay hair. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. Like MJ. Oh, dear. There's like the gameplay outside of the swinging, I think, is just generally bad. There's stealth sections you have with other characters like MJ and, and another and character. Miles, yeah, 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 Miles as well, where it's like it's literally MJ doing a sneak section. So are you playing as MJ? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So, so she goes, <laughs> there's a bit where you meet up with MJ and she's like, uh, I'll tell you how I got here. And it goes 15 minutes earlier and you have to play as MJ in a stealth sequence. That sounds mm -hmm. bad. For no, 10 minutes. it is bad. And like, it's so bad. There's this one section where she's like, um, has to like stealth her way through. But there's these little cardboard boxes making like a path. And it's like, try not to bang into the boxes because they'll fall over. And it's just like this whole path made of these fucking boxes. And that's it. It's like your challenge is don't touch the boxes. She's the best damn reporter in mm -hmm. New York. She's going to fucking get that story. Uh, there's no side missions. No, it's just busy work. Yeah, it's collectibles. And, like, there's no funny stories or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. just... It makes you feel empty inside. Like, Do you know what I was thinking about the side missions from Yakuza recently? I couldn't name you one reward I have ever gotten from a side mission in Yakuza. I couldn't name a single fucking thing. Like, they don't give you XP a lot of the time. All they kind of do, but, like, I... You don't do the side missions in that game for the upgrades. You do them because they're a fucking blast by themselves. These right? are these are purely to spec up Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. And like they get so frustrating. Like you first collect his backpacks and his 55 backpacks stuck around the city containing mementos. First of all, who buys 55 backpacks? That's expensive. Mm -hmm. And he puts like shitty weird objects in it like a menu. It like kind of made sense at the start we had like a toothbrush and toothpaste and it was mm -hmm. like oh, okay maybe he'd need that for like peter parker stuff yeah like i thought he would put like like gadgets or shit he might need while he's out in the mission or a change of clothes or something like that but it's just mementos and it's just a collect-a-thon thing to get some kind of flavor text of like hey this is when i fought like electro and i used ins insulation and it kind of builds up a little lore on it but that becomes annoying to me then later because a narrative point in the story is he gets evicted from his apartment and is one single hard drive where he's put every single piece of technology he's ever created of Spider-Man was in his bedroom and gets put in the bin. And then he has to chase after garbage trucks. Yeah, so you'll stick no, mementos I, 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 I all really... around the city of just random shit, but you won't back up a hard drive and hide that in a backpack on top of a tower. I did really like that he had to look after the garbage trucks. I just wish it had a better like reason, reason or rationale yeah. to be there yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Like, I, I think some of my favorite things about Peter Parker and Spider-Man is that, like, I know there's a bit in the comics, in the original comics, where, like, he had an ingrown toenail, and he was diff and it was really, really sore, and he was dealing with that difficulty, while also trying to fight bad guys. And I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I like there's that. Always, there's always been yeah. the human elements that yeah. other superheroes don't have. And he has I this, like, he has this inconvenience monotony to him that's so relatable. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the appeal of Spider Man. Yeah, no, I, he seems I, like a yeah. person with powers. Yeah. Like I, I love Spider Man. I, I, I prefer yeah, Spider Man cool. to Batman, but like I think part of it is the villains as well. Like I like I think both Spider Man and Batman have like the best villains. I like Spider Man too, but I think this is a bad Spider Man, apart from the swinging stuff and like his quips generally are fine, but yeah, like right. in terms of where he is in this narrative, I don't think it's a good story for Spider Man. In terms of the quips, uh, John? You would fucking hate this game so much. Mm, yeah. What What did you say to me at the start of this? You were like, I've never played a game. I've never played a game more that John would hate. Like, this is like, they made a game specifically for you to dislike. Yeah. Like, this is 100% not aimed at you in any capacity. It's funny. Even when I hear people talking this game up, because like the game's got a lot of praise. Everything people are saying they like about it just makes me go like <laughs> oh. like it really it sounds like my anti-game like your version of hell would be you'd have to play this game over and over mm -hmm. so i'll give you an example of some of the side missions you have to do so the backpack thing that i mentioned then you beat up random goons and there you'll get a like little ding ding from your cop radio that tells you to go stop a car in progress and you'll stop the car and you'll do that over and over and over again. And it plays the same animation. And it'll say, play the same animation and the same quip. And you'll do it 
at nauseum. Asset reuse fucking yeah. destroys me with open yeah. world games. Then you will get to a point where you unlock side missions. And I was like, oh, cool, side missions. And then I met this man who was just like, my 12 pigeons are free around the city. Oh, Howard. Go find my 12 pigeons. And it's the same thing like with the car. You're just tracking down something that's speeding through the city. And like, and like it's, it's in meters. So it'll say you're like you're 50 meters. But mm-hmm. when you get to 25 meters, then you can grab the pigeon. So that's all you're doing. You're just trying to get close enough that you could trigger the button prompt to grab the pigeon Mm -hmm. and the pigeons have their own music it's called the pigeon music and it sounds like upbeat matrix music where it's like and there's a bit later on where a uh, spider-man has one one of his drones taken away by a pigeon and they use the pigeon music again so they've really really thought about this fucking these pigeons right sorry just complete tangent but it just reminds me of there and i forgot to say it to you earlier you know I'm watching the Tonegawa's Middle Management Hell, the kaiju spin-off? Yes. There's an episode of that I watched recently that ends with all the characters watching The Matrix Reloaded. Fuck yeah. Yep. It's so relevant. Back yeah. to Spider-Man. Um, just basically, jumping off the sound thing, I think in the music in this is awful. I think it's the most uninspired soundtrack I've ever heard yeah. in a yeah, video game I heard in my it's entire a, life. When it I heard sounds people like, being like Danny like, Elfman. Oh yeah, it's really like, you know, like, you know, the, the Marvel cinematic, it's like the music they use from that. It's and the I'm one like, fucking theme. I'm like, what? Like that's super generic cinema music. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is you're Spider-Man, right? But as soon as you get momentum, the brass kind of like raises up. And it's just like, and it's just, it's so fucking boring. I've turned the music all the way down and I'm playing Spotify. Like I need something else. What music, what music are you playing over Spider-Man? Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. (laughs) Peter Parker. He's a little piggy. (laughs) He's never listened to Nine Inch Nails. No, it's not. He's the fucking, and this version of Peter Parker as well. I need to like vent about this. So him, this is like older Peter Parker. So him and MJ have dated already and have broken up. MJ will like talk to him about like stopping a fucking crime. And she'll be like, we need to stop them. And then instantly afterwards, Peter will be like, we? Did she say we? Are we in Gummo? Could this be a thing? Are we going to be in a relationship again? And he's just such a fucking wet blanket sado. It's just like, oh my god. <laughs> like, it's just so lame. He's so lame and he's so annoying. She's just talking to you as fucking human. And then she's just like, um, Wait, Peter, Neve. maybe we're partners like in this like together and we can fight together. And but he's Neve, like, like my psychic. Is she friend zoning him? Oh my god, they've already been in a relationship. You can't. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> It's just really dumb because all he fucking talks about is like, does MJ like me? And then like Aunt May is like, you and MJ should get back together. And he's like, oh. I really miss that girl. <laughs> yeah. The lamest thing Peter has said in this game is in one of the like backpacks, he finds like smelly gym clothes. <laughs> and he legit goes, P.U., this stinks. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Uh, more gameplay stuff outside of swinging. You do like little like puzzles so you go to doc ox oh, yeah. uh, a thing and you do kind of like you're tracking the current and you have to put in little pieces and, and they are like the literal valve puzzles from the bioshock games mm-hmm. where you have to like correct a water flow from point a to point b mm. yep they are so uninspired and boring i fucking find them so tedious and the game basically opens with you having to do loads of them and you're just like okay i, I tried to do fine. as many of them as quick as i could yeah. to get them out of the way exactly me too and uh, my girlfriend rebecca was like what is that awful music and i'm like <laughs> that's the puzzle solving music <laughs> when you unlock your surveillance t- tower you have to join two currents together and that's exactly out of watchdogs as well and also the batman arkham games where you yeah. have like two frequencies and one is like oh, the width yeah, and yeah. one is the height but it's weird because, like, you know how in them you have to hold the joysticks in place? Yeah. Mm-hmm. In this, you just click it and then you can let go and it'll lock in place. Right. So it's e- it's even easier. Right. Like, there's very, it's minimal effort. I feel like there's app. no challenge to anything. Uh, then you get to the main story and I think the boss battles are fine. Like, they're fine to me. But there's a lot of the big moments that are just QTEs. And again, going back to this feeling like an older game... Like, the QTEs are super easy as well and have a very generous amount of time for you to execute them. So they don't feel like a challenge. And I'm like, why the fuck are you making me press X here or whatever? Like, just just play the cutscene at this that. stage, yeah, you know? That's so irritating. The only ones I like where you have to move a cursor into a circle and then grab. 
Because there's like a bit of like, oh, I need to move and press a button here. But the only reason that's like a bit more challenging is that you go, oh, it's requiring me to do something right now. Like, yeah. like it's you literally have to drag something into a circle with your cursor. And sometimes you have to press square like a bunch of times really fast. Mm -hmm. It's like these are criticisms that I feel are leveled against stuff like Assassin's Creed and then Assassin's Creed has gone to fix them. And again, in Assassin's Creed, when you climb a tower, it's usually an architectural building from the era that's kind of visually interesting or something. It's not a fucking police surveillance tower. Um, and people criticize the shit out of it. And there's no criticism here for this. I feel like Second Son has done open world like secondary con like side missions better. I feel like a game that's 10 years old, like Prototype, has done this shit better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once the hype dies down, I can't wait for the video essays where they it just gets fucking yeah. dragged through the mud. Completely. And like, this is this is this game's grand. Uh, I'm I'm enjoying it. As soon as I'm done, I probably won't think about it. Uh, I'm gonna trade it in as soon as I can. I just gotta chase that feeling and get it over and done with. I'm having fun swinging. I I love photo mode. Photo mode is the best part of this game. Yeah, the photo mode is really good. Absolutely best part of this. My game. one gra okay, like like the photo mode is really cool and it's super customizable with stickers and frames and stuff. My one gripe is that, and it's something Shadow Colossus does, is the left and right on the D pad on this game don't do anything but uh, but on shadow colossus if you press left on the d-pad it brought you to a separate pause menu of the photo mode mm -hmm. but when this you have to pause the game and then go, go into, into photo, photo mode right. but I, I wish i had that quality of life where it was only one button yeah. step away because then i would do it more yeah because it's War such a cinematic game had it like in a menu as well but then you could map it to con to a controller button okay um and i was just like oh maybe you can map it you can't no, you, you have can't. to like press pause go down to photo mode which sucks because a lot of the time you want to get something like mid animation or mm. something so you have to like i'm like sometimes with one hand being like trying to click the button trying to get a like cool like action shot and it's like if you just map that to yeah. like you said to one of the unused it, it, it does take buttons. a few attempts and like the, like there are like there are buttons on the controller that are not being used for anything yeah mm -hmm. it's just a simple like it could be a simple patch maybe they will fix it later but it, it should be done now especially with the hype and the sharing of everything mm -hmm. it should be as accessible as possible because because it is a very accessible game do you want to do last words on this give uh, your last your last few words uh if you're interested in this game buy it beat it sell it Otherwise, wait a year or wait, like, honestly, wait three months. It'll drop in price by Christmas. I bet this will be PS Plus next year. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. This game would have been, like, perfect for launch window launch release for PS4. Would have just, it, it feels like that kind of game. Yeah, it feels like on par with Second Son to me. Yeah. I think Second Son's better. <laughs> it looks about as good. Um, my last, I guess, closing words is I am not sure where the hype is is coming from with this game apart from people want the traversal nailed and they did nail it i think this is at best a seven out of ten game i would guess it's a game that look nice that looks nice and feels nice yeah games like that always do well initially and then the blowback starts like that's i've noticed that with so many games this generation mm -hmm. and like with stuff like say god of war is having its like video essay moment and like I've watched, like I watched the three hours <laughs> Joseph Anderson one, yeah, yeah, yeah. like and like there's a lot of interesting stuff to say about God of War because it's trying new things and we're talking about if they worked or not. With Spider Man, I feel like it is doing literally nothing, nothing new. It is the most basic of basic open worlds. I love open world games. I think they're probably one of my favorite genres. Love Assassin's Creed. This feels old in every way except graphically and i don't know why people aren't talking about the narrative and the weird cop shit more yeah i, I like brian said buy it beat it return it yeah there's there's more triple a games right because this is the the beginning of the triple a season up, up until christmas yeah shit's but, coming out yeah shit's coming out start with spider-man and work your way up I would say the most lukewarm of recommendations from the boss cast there. I think I, I had no interest in playing this game. I think you guys have pretty much affirmed all the... Like, I, I had all these... I had a lot... Well, not all. I had, like, a lot of these concerns in the trailers. Like, I was not hyped by the trailers. But, um, yeah. What do you guys think of Puddlegate? You think it's stupid? 
Yeah, this is... That... Like, it's gorgeous looking. The game's beautiful looking. Yeah. Like, you can't fault it on that, and you can't fault it on detail. So, Although, the puddles don't have reflections, but whatever. <laughs> so, Puddlegate was what, compared to the tech demo to the final product... Yeah. Puddle textures People are not... argue that there was a graphical downgrade, to which the developers responded, there is no graphical downgrade. It's the textures with how they do reflections is different. Um, and they change the size of the puddle for, as an artistic thing. You know the bit where you do the fight with the helicopter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you're beating the people up in the tower? Yeah. It's in that area. One of the puddles was just bigger. And yeah. they were just like, it's a graphical downgrade. And it's like, it's a texture difference. That's all it is. Yeah, they just they just tweaked stuff That's they fine. use textures for um all the reflections in this is like a cheat like it's not a real-time reflection it's a it's a it's a texture map kind yeah. of thing like, it, it, especially, and it works and it's amazing yeah it, especially with some of the buildings where like some of the buildings are just like tin foily wi- like windows but other ones you could see through the window but if you go around the corner and look in the window it's not the same mm-hmm. build or it's, it's not the same interior as like oh, 45 degrees right yeah, yeah. and like like the tables and chairs are painted to the walls yeah Mm -hmm. but that's because you're not meant to like stop and look yeah yeah like you're really not meant to scrutinize the game that much it's just but what they will do to their credit if you need to land on a building for a story moment that room is usually a bit more yeah like yeah detailed yeah it was weird watching that stuff come out because like um i watched i watched like the comparison videos and all that stuff and like i do have to say i i do think like the end product was not quite why as impressive as like the pre-release footage and like i i do think there was like a bit of a shift there not even in terms of just textures in terms of lighting and stuff like that as well uh, not enough to give a shit about i thought but what i guess i would say and like honestly what i filed a little bit concerning about this is i saw a lot of people really vehemently pushing back against the idea of that was pre-release footage, you know, pre-release footage, you have to take into account this, this, and this. And particularly, it was one tweet from the Witcher developer where they were like, look, pre-release footage, it's an advertisement. It's the game shot at the right angle, lit in the right way, and all this kind of stuff. And he was arguing that, like, basically, you can't take pre-release footage because that's them trying to sell you a game. And I really had an issue with that. Yeah, I, that's I, had, I had a genuine problem with that because it's like, well, no, listen, hang on. Like, if this is an advertisement, like, you need to be very clear about that. And I don't even mean just in like pre release footage, not reflective of the final product. It's like, if you are doing things to make this look better than it will actually look, that's kind of fucked up. And I haven't heard, like, in every video game podcast I've listened to, I haven't heard anyone actually argue that that's kind of a skewed way to look at this because that's looking at it from the developer side and I get that but I also feel that's kind of anti-consumer as well. No, it completely is. I completely agree with you. And like, I'm not not specifically talking about this Spider-Man case. I think Mm -hmm. people really jumped off and really went nuts with this Spider-Man case. That said, I looked at the graphics comparison and yeah, I thought the pre-release footage looked better. I, I thought the lighting was nicer and not... Again, not in any serious way. And I get, like, optimization happens and all these things I could see being optimization. But when you have developers out there, like, you know, leads on, uh, you know, the... What are they called? CD CD Project Red. Red. Yeah. Yeah. Like, actually saying, yeah, look, no, we are actually putting... Like, it's never going to look like this when we release it because this is pre-release footage. That's fucked up. It's like, no, it this you are making a case for people to buy your game... And I understand if you put an honest trailer out being like, hey, I'm pretty sure that this is the game that's going to be releasing in two years. If you have to optimize it, if you have to downgrade it, I think that's fine. I don't. I think that's grand. But if you are actually saying, listen, we're putting out this material, we know it's not going to look like this, but this is the nature of the business and we need to get people interested, that's fucked up. That is genuinely fucked up. Did, did you see what they did with Cyberpunk 2077? No. They have a 45 minute like, oh, yeah, yeah, gameplay, yeah. but it has a watermark the entire way through where it's like, this is not the final product. Yeah, and like I've heard a lot of. But they're just covering their ass with that shit. Yeah, no, and I've heard a lot of podcasters being like, well, you know, this is what they have to do because they're scared to put footage out because of how crazy people get around it. And like, well, podcasters you... I really respect, and I'm kind of like, no, that that's. 
these companies should be feel responsible to not put out false impressions of their game. They shouldn't be like they shouldn't be trying to drum up hype for a project that is not feasible. Yeah. That's the onus of that. It's false advertisement. The onus of that yeah. is not down to the consumer, that is down to the developer. And it kind of honestly like I'm kind of disappointed with games media that that stance is being ridiculed and that they're pretending that like you know, every time this happened, it's like, oh, people don't understand game development. Like, when it happened with Watch Dogs, that was not the product they put out, mm-hmm. you know? And it's... They showed a short film, and then they released a game, and the two were not connected. But people were, like, rightfully mad about that. I don't know why the opinion has changed, where it's actually okay that they put out something that's completely different. Like, with the Spider-Man thing, I watched the Digital Foundry video, where they're actually talking about what changed, and like there was it, it was mostly artistic like mm. it was artistic reasons they changed the lighting and time of day of the scene so the reflections were different they changed the costume texture because they wanted it to look more like cloth than something that was shimmery and i can totally like see all of that it is really really disappointing to hear that podcasters and other game journalists are agreeing that they should put out these stu- these things like i feel that is anti-consumerist to the highest degree and like i feel like the reason that is being given is like well look you people just don't understand game development it is not the problem of the consumer to understand game development mm-hmm. it's the responsibility of the developer to ensure that when they are doing pre-release stuff it is an accurate representation of the product being sold and mm-hmm. i'm genuinely very disappointed not to hear to hear that stance discarded i think it's it sucks and it also takes very little like say if cd project red are showing pc footage versus console footage say if we're talking like a like um or the pc release of witcher 3 versus the early ps4 release all they couldn't do like if they put on this is play uh, pc footage you know what i mean yeah it's, this is this this is a full spec this, version of the game yeah this and is like the even, highest graphical like they have that note and there even that you're telling people that they'll need the highest spec to be able to run something like that. And I think that's fine. I yeah. think that's, I mean, people, if people really care about that stuff and they can afford it, they'll go for it. And you're letting them know the deal they're in for. But yeah, it's yeah. just... It, 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 it's fine if it's a cinematic and it says like, this is a cinematic. It's not... Yeah, not actual game. In, it's in not game. Game I think the whole yeah. thing of like designing a gameplay demo and like looking and like, disguising it a cg cutscene as gameplay i think that's fucked up i don't think people should do that and obviously like that's not a dramatic thing but even in more granular things i think it's you know developers should be responsible for this kind of stuff and they should be held accountable for when they fuck up like this Mm -hmm. and i think it's it was weird seeing how hard things seem to be swinging back i think the reason and this is me putting my tinfoil hat on i think the reason why podcasters or whatever is kind of more siding with the developers which i think they should never do like i think it's your like not never do but i think it's your kind of job to be impartial about this kind yeah, of stuff they should always be professionally cautious yeah, or pro-consumer at least at the heart of it mm. um i think why people are kind of leaning to why they not us are leaning towards the more developer side of thing is because some of the pushback from fans and capital g gamers is so vitriolic and I, I do understand that. Yeah, so I think there's this kind of pick a side mentality where the kind of rights of the consumer is getting lost in the middle because I think both camps have, like, and I hate that there's an idea of both camps. It's like these kind of, like, you're either with us or against us well, kind like, of mentality. For, for, you know, for all we're talking about, like, this stuff, like, I'm sure there's people who agree with what I'm saying but who are also sending, like, you know, vitriolic, abusive mess. And, like, that's totally not what I'm advocating for at Oh, no. All. Yeah, but and that's it, what I mean. It, yeah, like, exactly. It's But that's why I think that... podcasters are kind of backed into a corner to think being, like, because, like, they're all on, on Twitter and all they're seeing is these comments and these, like, YouTube videos, which is just, like, nearly death threat kind of stuff. And they're like, well, of course the developers are going to do this. And it's just, like, well, also siding with putting out false information to trick a consumer into a purchase yeah. that they mightn't have met otherwise is not right either. And then there's like, there are certain YouTubers who I really saw jump on this downgrade and try and like frame it as a conspiracy, which is equally shitty. Mm-hmm. Like that is just as shitty as, you know, a developer. And like, I'm, look, I'm not saying that the Spider-Man people actually did put out knowingly false footage. I just, yeah. Anyway, that was just something that was on my mind a little bit. I wanted to get it out there. But um, 
Yeah, Spider Man. Triple A games are weird. Triple A games mm-hmm. are so weird. But um, finally, in the strategy talk section, there's one game I just want to talk about a little bit. And when we talked before, Brian, you were saying that Spider Man, you like it, but it leaves you a bit cold inside. It makes me feel empty, yes. <laughs> Let me talk about a game that has left me so warm inside, and I like it so much. I am so happy I decided to take the plunge with it. I want to talk talk about Dragon Quest XI, and I think the subtitle for this one is Echoes of an Elusive Age. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is one of those games where it feels like from minute one, there is so much consideration gone into every tiny part of it. It's the newest in the Dragon Quest series for the PlayStation 4. I think the Dragon Quest series predates Final Fantasy. Yeah, I, I, I believe it. Maybe. Well, maybe. Let's check that. They're definitely yeah. late 80s, both of them. Yeah. Um, is Dragon Quest on the NES as well? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. I'd say so. Who 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 develops these games? Square. 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 So Square develops Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, mm-hmm. but it's different teams. Yeah, and Dragon oh. Quest. First relief was 86 for Dragon Quest. That's what was Final Fantasy? Let's see, Final uh, Fantasy. 87, 88, maybe? Because it was an alternative, maybe a more serious tone compared to the the wackiness that is kind of evident in Dragon Quest. And wasn't the whole idea is that like it was a make or break game? Eighty seven a year and di- the difference. God. Yeah. And Dragon Quest has actually weird ties with the origin of Shonen Jump as well. Shonen Jump was originally fuck I can't remember the specifics. It was something to do with Shonen Jump. No, actually, I'm not sure enough about this story. I might be thinking of a different magazine, but it's really weird, and people should check it out because it's really interesting. Well, it's got Toriyama doing like yeah, the 2D design for it. So this is the 11th Dragon Quest game, and just like the design of this game is like immaculate. Like you start off in your village, and like you know you have to like go find go, go to your house, and I find that happens a lot in RPGs, and you have to like go through every village in the house, every house in the village, and like try and find where your house is. But someone just says, "Oh no, there's a cobblestone path. If you follow it, it'll take you all the way through the village to your house." It's like, oh, the entire game is full of little conveniences like that, where they have just considered every aspect about the world these characters live in, the how the monsters interact with each other how your party members interact with each other, all just these little tiny details that add up to this just fucking beautiful-ass RPG. I really, really am having a great time with this game. I'm nine hours in, and the biggest thing I could say about it is I have run into, like, no gripes. It is just a lovely, smooth experience the entire way through. It's like you start off as um, just this random guy, very early plot reveal is that you're like the reincarnated version of the first hero from the first Dragon Quest game and from there it's like you meet this thief and you and him team up and it turns out you're meant to be like you're, you're the luminary you're meant to be like this prophet but then the king that then then this turns out there's a bunch of people who don't think you're the prophet they think you're satan okay it's fucking weird yeah so there's a duality cool. huh? yeah and um Woo! It's like, it's weird because in a lot of ways, it's a real typical RPG. Now, it's doing things like it takes swings with its plot that I was not expecting. There's some shit that happens like early on in the game where I was like, what? Really? This is, this is darker than I was expecting. But it's a lot of it's like very traditional, but I always say like do it different or do it better. This does the RPG formula maybe tighter and better than I have ever seen before. It's like, the battles take exactly as long as they should. All your party members, so far at least, are really likable and fun, and they have these really fun exchanges with each other. The game is beautiful. Like, it is such a gorgeous game. It has that, like, Akira Toriyama art style, um, and I don't know if he actually did work on it. I, I can't imagine he's still actually doing designs for these games, especially... I'm pretty sure Akira Toriyama is like a team of 25 people now. <laughs> yeah. And like, there's one guy at the top who's actually called Akira Toriyama and he like gets a check and goes, yeah. Every time he does a design for Dragon Ball Super, it is the most stupid, basic, like circle with the face characters. But um, 
his designs, I think, I think I've think i always, you know, obviously been a huge fan of Kira Toriyama's designs, but they translate so well into the 3D here. And it's not just a modeling thing. It's like there's so many points of animation on each character. Like one of the girls is this little girl with these like kind of golden pigtails. And the way they animate as she moves her arms and stuff is just, it's beautiful. Like it looks really good. The lighting is incredible. Like, the character models are quite simple compared to a lot of stuff. Like, they wouldn't be, you know, they're quite bold and realistic. Like, they're not realistic, or not. They're, they're very chunky designs. Chunky mm. designs is what I call them. But, like, the lighting on, you know, all little pieces of metal on the characters have, like, these really in-depth reflective surfaces. The textures are always, are always like, really crisp and convincing. And, like... When a character goes into shadows, the characters, the, the, the colors don't get darker. Like, they mix a lot of blues and purples into the character's palette. Oh, so, so they have looks, a new palette for yeah, night? Yeah, it looks cool. beautiful. So sometimes I'll see an enemy and I'll fight it at night and I'll fight it again during the day and their palettes look totally different. And I can't tell if they've actually gone in and redesigned the enemy's palette or if the lighting engine is just really, really smart in its color theory. And... It's so good. It's so, so good. Um, What's the battle system like? Really, really traditional. But turn-based? Yeah. Really turn-based, but like... And it doesn't have any active time to it. It's No just... active time. Just okay. like each character's actions are governed by their agility. And so your thief can move, will end up taking a lot of turns. You as the character will end up taking less turns and stuff like that. But... Um, the battles are so much fun because the because like the monsters and the variety are so much fun and it's little things like your character has different attack animations sometimes he'll leap across the screen and slash a monster sometimes he'll run up to the monster and do a big heavy slash and then there's all these little underneath mechanics that are going on like um, there's this whole mechanic where at random at, i guess what seem like random points your character will go into it's really dumb in the localization they call it they'll get pepped up in the japanese version it's that they'll go into the zone like a flow state mm. which yeah. is where they become like a super saiyan version of themselves basically but after a while of playing you realize it's not random there's mechanics and rules that govern this so say like there's a big emphasis on it between um there's a big emphasis on bonds in this game a lot of the characters have very strong relationships to another to one another so your character the luminary has a really strong relationship with the thief character he meets at first eric and from what i can tell eric seems to get a lot of if, if your character gets hyped up if your character goes into the zone that'll add a lot to Eric's meter so that he'll go into the zone. And this is all under the mechanic stuff. There's a pair of sisters in it, so when one sister heals the other, that'll add to her meter so she'll start to go into the zone. And it's really interesting kind of figuring out how they all work together. And then, like, the limit breaks. All the characters can do these big, massive cinematic team attacks, and they're really cool. But what's cool is, I at the start, I thought it was just characters that have, like, specific bonds. It turns out it's every character. They all have combinations. And some and some characters even have, like, it's the three of them and they all do this team attack. Like, I did this crazy one which basically turned one of my characters, like, into, like, a werewolf state. He held in front of the full moon and a tribal wolf appeared on the moon. It was really stupid, but it was amazing. Sweet. And the game is just constantly surprising. And, okay... One of my biggest problems with Final Fantasy, and this will be something I'll talk about more, is Final Fantasy XV was like, what are the two biggest factors about Final Fantasy XV's open world? One, it's filled with humans that have settlements like ours. Two, it's full of roaming monsters. You know what really pisses me off about that world? There's no walls in any of the cities, so what's to stop the monsters rampaging through the city and destroying it? The answer, nothing. The answer, don't think about it because it's a video game. Those questions don't happen in Dragon Quest because... The cities have walls that developers have thought about how these communities function. It's like in the first three hours of Dragon Quest, I encountered, or the first maybe five hours, I encountered five major towns. They all had like, like culture and quirks to them. And there was like backstories that you could read about in the library. And there was like slums and like, you know, a societal structure that was interesting and then like you go out into the world and you can see the monsters interact with each other like 
There's this one monster and he beats a drum and all the little slimes dance around him to the music he's playing and it's so cute and I feel so bad murdering these monsters but they're also <laughs> really fun to kill. And it is just a goddamn fantastic RPG. Like this this is one of my like if it if it keeps up at this pace and I'm 9 hours in, this is going to easily be one of my favorite games this year and I'm so happy because I feel like I've kind of haven't run into a lot of games this year. I, I love but this game is just, I have the stupidest, dumbest fucking smile the entire time I'm playing this game. And I, I love it. I'm so excited to play this. The whole time you've been talking about it, I've just been smiling because it's the exact stuff I love from RPGs. And I think RPGs do well when they do it well. Yeah. It's just that level of world building. Yeah. And it just sounds amazing. And I'm really excited to play it. And like, none of it's that in depth. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like there's pages and pages of lore on every town. But it's little stuff, like, you talk to one person in a town and they'll just be like, oh, you know, I know this other person lives mm. in this town. And then you'll find that other person and they'll be like, oh, hey, I actually know this person. And, like, they have established mm. relationships. But, it, like, these things don't need to be big. It's like what you talked about, like, with the walls. It's just logic. Mm. Like, why don't they have walls in Final Fantasy? They have one road, you know? Like, what is that used for? Is that used for transporting goods? Who built that? For what reason? Like, there's, like, the goodness... The good part of RPGs is explaining why a world works and how you fit into it. And it doesn't have to be with a fucking dialogue dump it just needs to be with visuals sometimes and that you can make your own conclusions from it and this sounds like it has that stuff yeah you know? and like it's cartoony and it's simple but it's there like mm. these towns have a culture these monsters have habits you know and it's and like I, I guess just to mention like the animation on these monsters is so good like and a lot of these are really typical dragon quest monsters like you know the slimes and like the hammer hoods and stuff like that but even monsters i've seen in previous dragon quest games it's like they're so fresh here because they have like the zombies have a little bit of drool that's hanging out from their mouth and like swinging back and forth and it's like it's just it is such a good game and i'm like I'd really just want to go home and play it. Like, it's it's so cool. And even if the game turns to utter shit right now, I feel like I've got my money's worth from the first nine hours. Like, I've really, really gotten a lot out of my time with it. And, I, you know, I haven't even gotten half the cast. I haven't... There's been a bunch of stuff I haven't done yet, but it's just been good. And, like, the localization... I've seen people complain about it. It is corny. Like, you know, all the characters have, like... British accents and stuff. Oh boy! What is with that kind of like? Is it like yeah? Because it's in Xenoblade as well. Yeah, Xenoblade with that kind of like Cockney accent that like Japanese like developers love. Yeah, but it's not bad. It's actually pretty all right. Like it's well, not. I, I guess this is European fantasy. Yeah, yeah. it's not. It's, it's not. Core. And like it's interesting because the Japanese version actually has no dope. Oh really? Japanese version is just text. But so there's I, no voiceover for. No whoa okay that's a big difference but so i heard anyway yeah um but um and but i i like the voice acting in the in the dub i think it's they do have accents but the voice actors all seem very talented and it just kind of sounds like they're having a good time with it and that's kind of the thing about this game it's just it's just a really nice good time and the voices feel like they fit each character yeah totally cool there's one guy who has one of the strangest accents i've ever heard it's like a combination between a London accent and like a Brooklyn accent. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's something else. I presume this is all like American voice actors told to put on Cockney accents I sometimes. I don't think so. Or at least London ones. I know with Xenoblade, some they were them, all from London and they were told to put on fake Cockney. But they some could, of them some are like a, weird Welsh accents. Yeah. Some of them are a little too convincing. One of them is definitely American trying to do like an old timey accent. But then, like, there's other accents in there as well. Like, I just met a new character, and he has, like, a real sort of um, kind of Italian-European accent, and that's a lot of fun. That's the... Silvando, I think is his name. The kind of campy guy? Yeah. I like him. I've seen a lot of clips of him, and they I like him a lot. They play the fuck up out of that camp, and it's pretty great. Cool. He's a scream, by the sounds of it. He I, is a scream. I love that in um, JRPGs as well, is like regional accents. And like, I know you're not a fan of Final Fantasy X, but like the Besaid accent is different than the Luca accent is different than this accent. You know, I, I like I've, that. I've come around a lot on Final Fantasy X. Yes. <laughs> a lot. And like, even through playing 15, I was like, man, remember how like the Albed have like a culture yes. that ties into the overall story mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff? And like, 
Uh, yeah, I, I think I think I was just a teenager, a moody teenager playing ten, and when I look back on it now, actually, I actually think that game's pretty cool. Still think Titus sucks. You'll come around. No, I won't. Your heart will soften. It will absolutely never soften. Sometimes boys need to cry. Yeah. Showing emotions perfectly okay, and we're not taught that enough for men. It's just a Sometimes shame. Boys, it's just a shame when that emotion is whoa. Sometimes boys need to laugh. Neve Titus can fuck off back to Kingdom Hearts. Shut up, both of you. Ha 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 He's putting on that laugh to make Yuna laugh. Ha <laughs> ha! It's meant to be silly. <laughs> Everyone who criticizes that. It's fucking scene has only heard the criticism and doesn't know the fucking narrative reasons for it. It sounds like Shenmue it's dialogue. Said, yeah, that's that bit. Because it's meant to. She's like, she's trying to cheer her up. It's a joke. It comes across as really still to the novel. Yeah, because it's meant to. <laughs> it, but Neve, it just, it's just bad. You know what? I'm, I'm back. I'm back in. Final Fantasy X fucking sucks. <laughs> <I> hate both of you. It's, it's just interesting that Titus can charm you, but not us. Yeah. Because of well, your toxic masculinity. Like hey! hey! <laughs> I try so soft. Try so hard to be soft. I believe my masculinity has a purity to it. I, I bathe every day, so there's no toxic in my body. I had a bath before coming here. John, move us along. You're the host. Get me out of no, this. No, no. I think we can get a lot more material out of this. Quick time events. <laughs> Crystal Chronicles remastered. Is this the Final Fantasy game for the GameCube? Yes. Wow, that's a blast from the past. I'm really excited about this because I s Mitch school and I went all the way to Dublin to buy a GameCube to play Final Fantasy, Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. And then when I was playing it, I realized it was better to play with a friend, but I didn't have a friend who would play it with me. So I struggled all the way through that game and it was very difficult. <laughs> so I'm really excited to get an opportunity. Was it a good game? Yeah, it's one of those like Final Fantasy games where it's about, it's really dark. The story is really, really, really dark, but the graphics are so cute. That's crazy. I never knew yeah, that. It, it's, it's got that weird night guy with like a pointy beak. Mm -hmm. And it came out in what, 2003? 2002, 2003. And at that point, there wasn't any Final Fantasy games on a Nintendo system for about like a almost a decade. What's it out on? It was GameCube. Yeah, but what's it oh, coming? It's coming to PS4 and Switch. I think I'm gonna give that a go because I yeah. I always really like the look of this game, but I never played it. It's, a it's top super cute looking. Game, yeah. yeah, I think Switch would be a great format for it, but the but because of the multiplayer aspect, maybe PS4. Do just, we have a date? No, it was just announced at the PlayStation Roadshow event. Cool. Left Alive will launch February twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen. What's Left Alive in? Left Alive is that that mech game made by a the character designer, the mech designer of uh, Ghost in the Shell Arise and Gundam. I don't think I've heard about this. It was announced like last year at E3, wasn't at this E3 and people were like, where's Left Alive? Because it was said it was going to come out this year. Uh, it looks cool. I am pumped for this game. It looks like Metal Gear and mechs. It's like political intrigue. It has three characters and it takes three diverging pa narrative paths and it's all like mech military intrigue. And I think it looks cool. I hope it plays cool. I'm very excited for it. Oh man, yeah, that does look good. Oh, interesting. Um, what else we got? We got, oh, oh God, oh God. It's the new title from the Yakuza studio. I haven't heard about this either. Judge Eyes. This all came out today. It was yeah. the PlayStation uh, lineup tour that they had. But this is, yeah, Judge Eyes, uh, you play as a lawyer. So you spend your time time in court, but also beating people up. It's, You're a private investigator as yeah. well. Kind of like how Phoenix Wright is. Sign me the fuck up. And that it, sounds awesome. And it takes place in the same universe as Yakuza. Yeah. So you're solving crimes in Camarocho and you do um, a mix of gathering evidence, presenting evidence, sneaking, searching, eavesdropping, and fighting. Okay, that that sounds incredible. I'm, I'm so glad they're doing something that isn't Yakuza. Because mm -hmm. like at this point, they've been doing Yakuza for years. And like, you know, they've yeah. got the formula down and Yakuza's awesome. But just, yeah, I'd love to see what those guys do. I'm sure to this, be honest, yeah, I'm sure this has the exact same Japan simulator vibe. Yeah, it looks like the battle system looks like Yakuza. Mm -hmm. But like the fact that there's this law element. And I've always wanted my lawyer game. You have. 
So, but even like I love cool. how much, I love how you know entwined with the culture and lifestyle of Yak of being Yakuza Yakuza is, and the idea of turning that focus to a different lifestyle is super intriguing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that sounds really it's awesome. It's like you have the crime side of it, and then the other side is the law side. Try to prosecute all of this. Mm. Like maybe this character could run up to Kiryu, <laughs> like run up against Kiryu, or any of these things. Or even if they don't, it's just interesting that they would be prosecuting these people in that world. Yeah. That sounds really, really cool. Oh man, I'm so excited for that. I think they were the big announcement from the PlayStation lineup tour. There was more stuff. Are you um, forgetting Samurai Spirits? Yes. Samurai Showdown, everyone. This is a new Samurai Showdown. This was an SNK fighting game yep. for all you Johns out there. Yep. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone listens to this podcast is very familiar with Samurai Showdown. Come on, guys. SNK's third most popular fighting franchise. I had a folder of gifts. That's about the it. Sprites are really cool. Yeah. And so is the background art. Yeah, it's yeah. Really, no, it's, got, it's, it's, it's got a lot of waterfalls and coastlines. Yeah. It looks great. Um, so this a lot of people were speculating that this was going to be a new Samurai Showdown game. And it, and it is. Like, that's that's what it is. But um, this is 3D. And I thought it looked really cool. Like, it, it is not the kind of ropey 3D from King of Fighters 14. It's much more stylized. And, like, they've really kept to the Samurai Showdown kind of formula where there's, like, kind of blood in it and stuff. And it's just, it looks really exaggerated, but cool. And um, I'm excited because Samurai Showdown, it, like, it's such a different kind of fighting game. Like, it's much more defensive and hits do much more damage because they have weapons, you know? And, yeah, very hyped for this. Trailer's great. People should check it out. Yeah. Uh, then there's other one, or this going going back a couple days. We have other announcements. Uh, Niv, this is a game. The Anim- Animusha remaster. I was really happy about this. I like Animusha or Animusha. Um, I think it's cool because everyone's been like, you know, with all the re- the announced trailers like for Sekiro and like Neo. Everyone's been like Animusha, bring back Animusha. So like getting a hd means we might get a new one in the series the first game it came out in 2001 it was great at the time and this was a ps2 exclusive it was yeah. one of the like i remember playing titles. i remember playing that game being like oh this is the new shit mm-hmm. so i would be so curious as to how it holds up um it has a brand new soundtrack and voice acting huh. for this remaster I, I i liked the old voice acting it was kind of terrible it was kind of great it's gonna make it better hopefully who knows? I, I, hopefully, I, 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 hopefully there's a toggle. Time. Like, like I think, like yeah, that's ideal. yeah, that would be ideal, perfect. Um, the Nintendo Direct was delayed due to an earthquake. Yeah, this 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 is pretty interesting because they had a Nintendo Direct a couple of weeks ago, and they announced they were going to do one uh, Thursday last week. And my kind of reaction was, "That's fine. You, you don't need to do one. You just did one. It's it's cool. Like I, I, I'm sure we can all wait." And they were going to have another Smash announcement as part of this Direct. And then they had a bunch of natural disasters on, on Japan, uh, yeah, on pretty, the island. Pretty rough week. They had, yeah, really fucking... Success. And they've had a really, really tough summer as well. They've had, like, a killing heat wave as well. Mm. And now they're into, like, typhoons and earthquakes. And it was a, an earthquake in Hokkaido in the north. And it was a national crisis. And, you know, people's families are at risk. And it's... Really, da- it's really dangerous, and they've had to just postpone the Nintendo Direct. And for the most part, everyone's been super understanding. But, you know, this is also video game fandom we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I really think the amount of people getting annoyed about this are so tiny, and I think the ones that are leading the charge are ones that are just baiting other people. Like, fuck them. Yeah, fuck them. Yeah, fuck them. But it is yeah. disappointing to see like forty-four people are confirmed dead in it, and it's just like. Come on, guys. Have some empathy. Yeah. Uh, the N on the Nintendo headquarters in Kyoto blew off in the uh, typhoon. Uh, it's pretty serious there. Nintendo. Yeah, Nintendo. Uh, so take your time. We're looking forward to the next Direct. I'm sure it'll be great. Yep. Final Fantasy XV Pocket. I had never heard of this thing. Really? It's coming for the Switch. Never. It's on mobile. You can play it right now if you want. It has one of the most hideous art styles I've ever seen. I'm a little torn. I think it's fine. I don't like, I don't think, like, I think it's stylized enough. I think I would like it more as an illustration or something. I think it just looks, uh, these Jack Skeleton looking motherfuckers. Yeah. 
I just don't understand why it's necessary. And you know, like on mobile, like it's like 20 euro to buy. You get the first two missions free and then you can buy the missions piecemeal, but like outright it's like 20. It's and it's like an abridged version of Final Fantasy 15. Yeah, and it's just like that story isn't that good to have a fucking, it's bad to have an abridged version anyway. Like I don't know what would even be in that. But anyway, it's coming to PS4 and Switch, and if you want to pre-order now, you get it for a cheaper price. But, like, at $17.99, and as well on the Switch when it first goes, it will be $30 on the PS4 and Switch at full price, which is 10 more than mobile. And I think you can get 15 for about that price. I don't know why anyone would bother. And this... <laughs> they also announced four more DLC packets for... Jesus fucking Christ. It's a game as a service. They fucking ruined Final Fantasy. You should get those DLC packs, John. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna. You love, I'm fucking gonna. You love Final Fantasy 15, don't you? Yeah, I really love 15. It's hasn't John's favorite game. Hasn't yeah. ruined my life recently, hasn't caused me emotional distress, hasn't gonna destroy my YouTube channel. It's fine. Hmm. It's fine. Mm-hmm. You should play the pocket edition. I think it might be a I nice. Think, I think if I just nice play refresher. one, if I just consume one more piece of Final Fantasy XV media, that's gonna do it. Mm -hmm. That's gonna make it all worthwhile. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, the Witcher TV series cast its Geralt. This is for uh, a Netflix exclusive big budget TV series, and Geralt is gonna be played by Henry Cavill, who plays Superman. They're gonna stick a wig on him, scar up his face, Superman. It's fine. I think it's cool that they have such a big name, but he is way too sexy to be Geralt, who is kind of sexy ugly rather than sexy sexy. And ironically, less sexy because of it. Yeah. Like, he would be sexier. If he was uglier. Yeah. Like, yeah, totally. You, 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 you need someone who's kind of like Norman Reedus. Where, yeah, I was thinking the exact like, same Like walking Norman the Reedus. line of like, yeah. just like, oh man, he's well, so put dirty. Well, it's someone with a little bit of a snarl on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because like, I, I would cast Norman, but he's too sleek and slender for the role. I don't you, know, Geralt's not like a tank. Yeah. He's not as buff as Henry. Yeah. I think it's just the name to have nearly at this stage. But I guess maybe they want to create some, some lady candy. Yeah, yeah. And I guess he's he's a decent actor it's to do It's probably a show for like couples to watch where like the guy's watching it because he's like, Oh, I love The Witcher. Yeah. And then like... <laughs> His girlfriend, Suzanne, is like, oh. <laughs> and, and Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne, She's stop so it. fucking thirsty. <laughs> stop. I'm, I'm Jason, and this is my girl. This is my girl, my bird, Suzanne. And all our friends are getting married, but I'm not ready. Ha, ha, ha. Can you do the rest of the podcasting character? This? <laughs> and Suzanne is like, I can barely look at you, but Henry Cavill's on TV. No, what, what's what's what, what's the dubbing? <laughs> We're just a couple of normos, you know. I played The Witcher when it came out, and I thought it was great crack. And uh, <laughs> well, I watch it on Netflix now, and it's really, it's really, so, it's like Game of Thrones, but you know, it's a bit like, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like, what's going on here? <laughs> like, is, is he a Witcher? You know, oh. is he Witcher? You know, woo! There's more controversy over the casting as well because um, someone got a hold of a casting... Um, a call sheet call application. Sheet, yeah. yeah, for Siri, uh, the character, and they're looking for a non-white woman. Well, girl, actually, because it's, it's meant to play a 13-year-old version of Siri. Um, and the racist assholes on Twitter are losing their shit because like Siri is like a daughter to me I have an established love for her and what about fan service like I literally read someone say what about fan service and I would argue the fan service is that the Witcher TV show is being made like man they there should, you go they should watch Preacher yeah they they change a lot of stuff like yeah, Tulip is a great like, example yeah Tulip's like a black lady and she's fucking incredible because they hired someone who had that attitude and that swagger as opposed mm -hmm. to their skin color and that's what they should have done yeah. mm -hmm. uh, what's her name again she's Irish Root Nega Root Nega yeah she's currently doing Hamlet in Dublin I've got tickets I'm so excited oh, female wow. Hamlet yeah. I've had tickets for months it's a really really cool poster as well I know and it's all around <laughs> could, yeah. you, could you tell her that me and Brian like her in Preacher 
no. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, Lady Hamlet, I love you. But she'll know, she'll know what it means. I know, I'm gonna actually watch Preacher in preparation to see her as Hamlet. She is a delight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This shit doesn't matter. Whatever. People mm. need to chill. Just they really do. It's called, it's called an adaptation. Go with it. Just, just, just enjoy it and you could be critical of it, but... It's so frustrating Just see what they do first. Me. Like, adaptation is the art of taking something and changing it for the medium or to tell the story in a different and more interesting way. Like, what's the point in making one-to-one -one remakes? Like, are you gonna go out and cast people who look exactly like a fucking character model? Like, why the shit would you do that? Just watch a fucking YouTube compilation of the cutscenes cut together. It already exists, it's right there, it's really, really boring to me. Like, the best shit in the world is having loads of different adaptations of something. That's why I like Shakespeare, because like a fucking across, like, years and years and years you've so many different versions of the one story and they're all cool it's preempted arguments people are like well, what if it was the other way around what if it was and it's like well no that's different because like like there's a massive problem in hollywood where like you know it is very hard to get work as you know a non-white actor but I, I hate that argument of like, what if it was the other way around? Okay, if it's the other way around, then everything has to be other way around. And then 99% of everyone cast for every fucking role ever has to be a non-white person. Like you can't just flip the fucking narrative on this one moment. You have to flip the narrative on the world we live in. Like, I hate that. That shit comes up all the time and it's so fucking dumb. Speaking of stupid arguments, let's move into emails. <laughs> I'll do the first one. Okay. okay. This one is from Danny. And Danny asks, um, so Danny first talks about Final Fantasy, specifically Final Fantasy 15, because it's something you've been talking about, John. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, but Danny's question is, my question is, if you could be anyone or anything, summons or whatever in Final Fantasy, what and why? Is Shiva, because it looks to be a beautiful lady. Is that it? Yeah. Doom Train. Gonna be a train of Pretty doom. Good. I don't know what a summon is. I don't play. I I I, I didn't get that far into Final Fantasy. My have brain was like, my Final brain Final was Fantasy? like, yeah, you have. I played Final Fantasy VII. But you didn't. You never played far enough to get a summon. No, I, I played enough to be like, this is great, and stopped. Um, huh. so, yeah, like, w do I need to play Final Fantasy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like, you don't need to play it, but I'll, they're, I'll, I'll, they're I'll play some it. of the best games in video games history. Well, do I, uh, Someday when I'm an old man, I'll play you 10. You have a SNES Classic, yeah? Yeah. Six? Brian, you wouldn't like 10. No. My fuck, he would like 10. No, Neve. No, I wouldn't. Brian would not like 10. Why wouldn't he like 10? Because, because I'd... 10 stupid, <laughs> Neve. Okay. Brian, play 6. Okay, who is the stupidest summon in 10? The, all the summons are fucking amazing in okay. 10. Okay, uh, the butterfly. Okay, I'm the butterfly from Final Fantasy 10. The butterfly? What do you mean the butterfly? The, he first, the first bird butterfly. That's thing. Veil for. Oh, I'm Valifor, so sorry! Oh, I didn't mean to insult Veil for the magical butterfly! Who catch- it's like a fucking bird or some shit. <laughs> sorry, sorry, so it's Veil for, is it? Yeah. I'm Valifor or whatever. Valifor, okay, you, you I'm don't even remember its name because it's It so doesn't say the name, it's written down and I'm dyslexic. It doesn't matter what it's called, it's cool. I'm really, really sorry for your ears, everyone. You would be Yo Yimbo. Because you only work for cash. <laughs> Yo Jimbo. He's so cool. He's a yes, he's cool. Yo Yimbo's a summon that will only do something if you pay him money. Yeah, I'll do that. Got to cough up. It's, uh, it's pronounced uh, Yo Jimbo. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll play Final Fantasy someday, but I have to play Dragon Quest first. Apparently. Play six. Oh, you don't have to play Dragon Quest. I don't give a shit if you play Dragon Quest. I don't, I don't want to play Sometimes it. I get real excited about a game and Brian would be like, okay, uh, okay, I might, I might play. I don't care. I don't want to play, but it's going to come up a game of the year and it's going to be like, I don't have no context for this I game. Give, that doesn't matter. That's like, yeah. game, our game of the year is a farcical show where three idiots argue about nothing. Yeah. And this year is going to be weird. Detroit's yeah. going to win. 
Yeah, no, it will. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> that fucking game. You know, though, when I think back on the games that, like, affected me this year, Detroit's going to be right up there. <laughs> yeah, it was the big conversation. Oh, what else we got? Okay, um... This is from... Fuya. And it is a... Yame Nabe, which in Japanese is a group of friends bring together what they want to throw into a hot pot and boil it. Uh, they cook it all together and they eat it as a group. Things get fun, abysmal, people bring their unusual nasty, hard food. So the question is, uh, what would your choice of food item be to bring along? If we all had like a hot pot, potluck, and we all had to bring like an item of food that all has to go in together in a big pot. I would bring... A very fine piece of chorizo sausage, oh, yeah. along with the most expensive mozzarella I could find. That's a really normal answer. <laughs> um, I don't know what, like a fucking cat. There, a cat. <laughs> in it goes. So treats. So some really good mozzarella and a cat. Yeah. Um, I want to compliment a chorizo. So I'm gonna go with a milder meat and throw in an entire horse. Yeah, right. <laughs> Neve, <laughs> don't think I can't hear that fucking whine in you. <laughs> an entire horse, half a banana, oh, Jesus a lime. Christ. I like a good bit yeah, of yeah, lime. Yeah, and lime, lime, yeah, yeah. limes, mate. Limes are and awesome. a dark chocolate. Okay. This is kind of turned into a chili. Red wine and fried chicken. Jesus. So oh. wait, what's what's the let's fight a boss potluck meal? Chorizo <laughs> and mozzarella. A cat. A cat. Horse, horse meat. meat. <laughs> <laughs> half a half a banana, a lime. Chocolate. Dark chocolate specifically. A fuck ton of fried chicken, and I'm talking chicken goujons. No bones, because I'm not an animal. Yeah. Fuck ton of chicken goujons. Once again, the three of us combine I into red wine and red wine. fucking mm-hmm. disaster. I want the red wine to like really puree it up. Yeah, the red wine's the sauce. <laughs> yeah. And we just like, we just knock it back yep. in a smoothie in a big fucking blender. And some kale, because we want to be healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you gotta keep it healthy. We, we should put, we'll probably put some chaya seeds in there as well. It's a yeah. superfood. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Yame. Porridge, oats, fill it all out. Quinoa. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay, um, Neov, there was a question you had lined up for us. Yeah, this is for me. <laughs> Hello, right. Father Ted, Father Dougal, and Father Jack. Thank you so much wait, for the podcast. Wait. <laughs> who's who there? Um, John's Father Ted, because yeah, he's for a sure. scapegoat. He's the financial scapegoat. <laughs> uh, Father Dougal and Father Jack are interchangeable, but I feel like I'm Father Dougal, Father Dougal at the moment. I think, I think yeah, you're I'm a little. Dougal. Yeah. I think Neve's the wild card. She's Jack. Neve gets nasty and says things about girls. <laughs> More water. Uh, thank you so much for the podcast. It hasn't saved my life, nor has it. Ad- and the advice you've so happily given out to your listeners been of any help whatsoever. Right on. Sweet. Um, I want to thank you for being a constant um, source of entertainment for the last one and a half years. This year has had its up and downs, but every single episode I've listened to has been a source of enjoyment, no matter the length. So thank you, and please never stop. It's hard to find new podcasts. The questions are, my first question is to Neve. I was diagnosed with autism around early 2000. During the years, I've noticed the representation has improved somewhat, but has a long way to go in pop culture media, at least putting in a better effort. Whereas representation of people on autism spectrum and pop culture is still lacking in my opinion. I bet from Community is the best fictional representation far and far, far below is the bar is Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory. Can you think of any uh, fictional autistic characters that's portrayed fairly in TV, movies and games? Because I can't. I have some that are canon and one that is my head canon. Where, where's the line between canon and head canon with this discussion? I think if you can support it with the narrative, then like what's to say? Like then, yeah, like it's yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting like. If, if if it's there subtextually, or you can you can be like based on this, I think this character might be autistic. Then I think it's like as good as anything else. Like autistic people don't go around being like I am autistic all the time. Well, sometimes. So, um. Okay. So, I, 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 I have met I have met a lot of young men that have approached me at cons and 
immediately brought up the fact that they're autistic. Yeah, yeah, actually yeah. you're right. Um, uh, but it's different for each people and it's also different in women. I've been diagnosed autistic and a lot of people- Have you? Yeah, and a, you don't yeah. know. No. But no. anytime no. I tell people, a lot of people go, Huh. Well, we did do an autism test before, remember? Yeah. And you got a nine? Yeah. And I was time. like, yeah, that makes sense. But then I got a seven and I was like, wait a minute. A lot of what we know and understand about autism is from a young male perspective. We don't really know how it affects older men and we don't know how it affects women at all. There's been very little studies about how it affects women and it's totally different to how it affects men. Yeah, usually in the media it's coming of age boy story Yeah. with autism. And you don't really like... Like, people could list off a lot of guys they know, but they wouldn't be able to list off a lot of women they know. Um, canon autistic characters that I think are good. I like Symmetra from Overwatch. I think there's a lot of opportunity to write that character better, but Blizzard don't know how to write nuance, so maybe that's not a thing they should touch. But they have confirmed that she is autistic. And I think that's interesting with her as this kind of character who is intelligent and driven and is making tech and is tech driven but is also seems naive she's kind of working for this company who she believes is doing the right thing but lucio is like they're actually not and she's like boo like you know it's like this naivety to her um again that hasn't been really developed too much and i don't know if blizzard are the company to do that uh, Elizabeth Tassoni from The Good Fight is a autistic lawyer because it's lawyers. There's another lawyer who tries to use her autism against her. So when she's fighting in court, he puts a really colorful magazine on the table in front of her. And a lot of people with autism have, what is the word I'm looking for? They get hyper focus. Yeah, not like well, it's hypersensitivity yeah. to shit around them and stimulus around them. So she's trying to stay on track with her, what she wants, her argument, but she has this fucking thing in front of her and her eye just keeps darting back and forth and she can't concentrate. I think she's a really great character. She's really funny and she's really interesting. A character that's new is Billy the Blue Ranger from the new Power Rangers, yep. which I watched recently and is really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, he says outright that he's autistic and I think he's a pretty good example. Yeah, he's real into teamwork, but also he likes that distance between yeah, him and yeah. the other rangers. Mm -hmm. And part of, a big part of that story is them trusting and opening up to each other. And he is a mental block for a, a, the first half of that film. Mm -hmm. And then another character, which we talked about earlier, which is why I feel like he went a bit through a little character assassination, is Wilson Fisk from um, The Kingpin. Uh, his portrayal in the Marvel TV series, people have been saying it seems like he's autistic. And I can see that. Yeah. yeah, and I can see it too. And like, there's obviously this bit of like, is a good representation if he's this evil dude? And I was just like, meh. You know what I mean? He's it's a compelling really... character. Yeah, he's a compelling character in person. And I think it kind of adds to his story. Me personally, I read him as that way. And I found him way more interesting as a character. Like, because I could of see that. it in terms of like, I felt like he has a certain like, social situations mm -hmm. like it, it always seems to be kind of painful for him to be grasping the subtlety of other people mm -hmm. and that would sometimes manifest in like kind of rage and I thought that was yeah I could see that uh, my big head headcanon character and people do not like when I say this at all is uh, Lara Croft is the new Tomb Raider version of Lara Croft I think she is so single-mindedly driven to the point that it's nearly hilarious she is driven by the problem. So in the first game, she needs to find this this box, this object. But by the end of the game, it's kind of put on a pile of her shit. Like it's not about the object. It, it's not about the preciousness of the thing. It was about, there was a puzzle that she needed to complete. I think you could say it's maybe a detriment to the games where there isn't a lot of characters for her to bounce off of. But when there is characters there, especially in the second one, I think there's a whole village of people who are like, Hey, Lara, help us out. And she's just like, I'm kind of doing my thing and you're interrupting that. Like she's so single-mindedly driven yeah. that I think is a positive and a possible negative autism um, that I, f I for one headcanon her as an autistic character. And they would be my autistic characters that there I would go. throw out. There we go, comprehensive yeah. list. <laughs> Um, and there was one other question, and I'm going to do a 
quickly because um, I spent a lot of time on that. My second question is about my favorite thing. There have been some mentions of Western comics like X-Men. Since you mostly talk about manga when it comes to comics, I was wondering which comics you're reading and enjoying right now. My favorite comic right now is uh, Warren Ellis's and Declan Shelby's Injection. Um, I love Injection, that's really great. Um, the comic I am currently reading is Hunt for Wolverine, which is a continuation of Death of Wolverine from 2014. And it is, I love it because I'm a Wolverine fan, but it is different characters looking for the corpse of Wolverine. So after Death of Wolverine, he was encased in adamantium and everyone in the world would want Wolverine's body. He has his healing factor. They would want it as a trophy. There's just so many reasons why people in the Marvel universe would want Logan's corpse. Mm. And from Hunt from Wolverine, it's a one shot. It spreads out into four different stories involving four different groups of people who all have relationships with Wolverine. So it's a comic that doesn't feature Wolverine alive, but features Wolverine in terms of his locations he's visited, the characters he's mentored, the characters he's fought. It's like everyone has something to say about it and about him. And it's like, if you're a Wolverine fan, it's this really, really cool collection of stories. Let the legend live on. Uh, Weapon Lost features Daredevil, which I really like. Adamantium ad Agenda is Laura, uh, Lara Kenny, uh, Spider-Man and Iron Man, Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. Claws of the Killer is Dakin, Sabretooth, Lady Deathstroke. And Mystery in Madipur is like Viper, Storm, Rogue, Psylocke and Domino and Jubilee. And they're all like looking for his body in these different places and fighting old classic Wolverine villains. And they're all talking about their relationship with Wolverine and how it's affecting the story. It's one of those weird things where it's like splintered off in so many ways. So it's kind of difficult to read because that's how Marvel releases comics now. But um, it's worth it if you're a Wolverine fan. Cool. What else we got, Brian? Uh, we got an email from Rachel who uh, asks about punk podcasting. Um, so she says, it strikes me as quite a punk DIY ethos, which might encourage other creators to go... Podcasting in general? Yeah. I'm interested in your feelings on podcasting, advertising, and in particular the use of free software for audio recording and starting out a small uh, podcast with a single USB mic between the three of you. Okay. Uh, it strikes me as quite punk DIY ethos which might encourage other creators to go ahead and make their own podcast with limited resources available. I'm interested in hearing Neve talking about the learning curve in post-production, editing a sound, uh, Brian talking about pre-production and technical setup and his learning curve with that. Do you think about yourselves as part of a podcasting community? If so, do you feel more part of an Irish or international community? So I guess we'll take this in chunks. Yeah. Um, so just about like I guess get getting started with the podcast and using free software and what equipment you have. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, when we started, it was just it was the microphone on my iPad. Yeah, and I was using the note like like the memo software. Yeah, to record ninety minutes of a memo. Mm -hmm. and, That's nuts. And converting that to an MP3 and slapping audio on top of it afterwards and like Premiere or something like that. Which is video editing software, but I guess you know we just turned off the video aspect and exported it as a an MP3 or a WAV, which is, I guess, a really silly but workable way of doing a podcast. I mean, you mm -hmm. could hear us talk. Yeah, it worked, but like it is really, you're like, let's do a podcast, and you're like, how? How do how, how do I capture audio? What's the best way of going about it? So I guess then I got a, a cheap USB mic, and we used that for a couple episodes. But then John got a Blue Yeti mic because of his YouTube channel, and we started using that. And we use we we we've always used my MacBook more or less to capture the audio. For ages, I was using an Apple software called Sound Studio, where you plug in the USB mic and it recognizes it as a direct input, and we captured it that way. But that was still all like one track. Yeah, and then Neil would sometimes go in afterwards in post production and up and down the audio levels because we all have very distinct voices. But then recently we've upgraded because of the Patreon. We have a ZE10 uh, USB audio interface, and we have three XLR mic 
microphones, cables, and stands. And they're all photos of them on our Instagram. Yeah, Mm -hmm. they're all fed into the ZE10, and then we use Audacity, and it captures it in three mono tracks, uh, three layers. So there's a John layer, an Eve layer, and a Brian layer. And then in post production, Neve adds a fourth layer with extra audio detail. Oh, there's more than four layers. (laughs) There's a lot of layers. Um, the editing side of it, I've always used Audacity because I'd never done audio editing. I didn't want to pay for an audio and not like it editor and not like it. I downloaded Audacity. I went to YouTube and watched a 16 year old tell me how to show me how to use it. Yeah. And they were right. They knew exactly what the fuck they were doing because 16 year olds on the internet do uh, when it comes to tutorials. And we're still using Audacity, and I've noticed a lot of people get mad that we use Audacity. You guys are using Audacity? Oh, fuck that. And people would rather we, like, shell out, like, 100 to, like, 600 on, like, a program. And I just, like, I don't see the point. You're listening to it in its form now that's been edited in Audacity, which is a free program that anyone can download and anyone can use to edit sound. I like it that way. I like to prove that we can use free p2p file sharing freeware software and make a good thing out of it you know what i mean yeah, like mm. it, it's not we're not we're not gatekeeping anything you like there's nothing stopping you dear listener from doing what we're mm-hmm. doing like i i've never done so- sound editing before we're all visual we work in a visual medium and sound has always kind of been a vague mystery so it's been kind of learning as i'm going yeah like there's probably a lot of jargon but like you wouldn't yeah. know what it is but maybe you you probably encountered it you just don't know the yeah. name of it i kind of know the video version of it nearly and it's kind of like well if i translate what i know about video into sound it's kind of the same ish and i'm learning more and more as i go and i do enjoy it a lot i probably will use audacity on this podcast for as long as we keep recording because it's reliable and it's free and it's good i think the only reason we never stop is if we ever came up a barrier that audacity couldn't cross and like, I mean, the work we do at sound is quite minimal. And mm-hmm. so I don't know what that barrier would be. And I have no doubt there's some probably really cool stuff that more expensive programs could do. But I also don't know if our technical proficiency would ever be high enough to take advantage of that. I think we'd just be at a loss. Or even if it, it's not necessary, like if people find this listenable and enjoyable, and a lot of people have come up to me and have like, complimented the sound design and the editing on this and been like i really like when you put music behind things a lot of people are also like you put too much music behind things and i I will take that on board and do less of it but um you know it seems to work i don't i don't know what thing we could do with a paid program that i can't do in audacity yet i'm sure an audio engineer could tell us but i think the thing to remember there is we're really not audio engineers yeah like we are just having a laugh no brian this is a serious venture (laughs) this is a small professional business having a laugh it usually takes about like uh, maybe three it took me really long to edit at the start because i didn't have a clue what i was doing but now it takes maybe around three hours if i'm putting a lot of work into it 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 takes it takes a while yeah yeah Yeah, it's It's usually like i can fly through it's usually like double the length of uh of the actual episode is how long it takes to to do the post-production on it how often do you cut stuff out, Neve? Um, if we drop a sentence or there's a bit of stretch of silence or like some of us make some like weird snotty sound, <laughs> I'll cut it out. Or if like that's like, a lot. Or like sometimes you know when conversation where you kind of repeat what yeah. you're saying. Like I'll cut like I was just like, well, we've said and we've made that point, so we've just met it again, but in a different way. Um, so for neatness sake or brevity's sake I will yeah, edit that I think that's for the best yeah which is why sometimes people are like would you would you stream your podcast live and it's like no fuck no or like even for the sake of like comedy like if there's something that I think is funny and I think it wants to like like I will cut, do a hard cut or something I you know what I mean a good hard cut yeah yeah oh. okay so then the kind of bounce off this is uh, do you think about yourselves as part of a podcasting community and I guess this is Irish and international. And like, I guess in the past year that we've been to cons and you meet people in real life, or you tell people you do a podcast as well as, you know, your animation career, there's that side of it where like you like to kind of talk about it in that way. I definitely feel like there is a little let's fight a boss community for sure. 
Yeah. Like I, I was saying to you guys earlier, I've never, I've I've never been to a con as I Patch Wolf and not met Let's Fight a Boss fans ever. But in terms of like, do I feel like we're part of a podcasting community? Like particularly an Irish podcasting community? Uh, not really. No. No. No, we don't really like interact with the rest of the Irish podcast sphere. No. Um, I don't even know if it's that big. Like sometimes I Google like Irish podcasting and like someone claimed the URL Irish podcasting, but it isn't really anything. It's just someone else's, you know, hub. Mm. Um, but there's like there's no real awards or anything we could even enter the podcast in to get seen in Ireland. I don't I think podcasting is a very young industry here specifically. Yeah. And even like when you think of award shows things like the kind of podcasts that win awards are like here's what this podcast is about. Every day we're going to review a different kitchen and it's like that's the premise and then for us it's like well what's the charm of this podcast? You're listening to three people talk about video games. And the charm probably isn't immediately apparent if you don't, if you're not in, like already kind of invested. Yeah, you yeah. know, kind of need to know the chemistry of the three of us and how we. Yeah, because like we get, we get a lot of emails about how a lot of people come from the Eye Patch Wolf channel, and so they're already kind of halfway in at that point. Yeah, and it's like pitching that to someone who has no idea about us is mm-hmm. like I think a tougher sell. And it's yeah. also we're like such online weebs, you know. It's like to a layman Irish person who listens to Blind Boys podcasts, how do you be like, it's this podcast that's full of online jokes and shit. Like, you know, it's, yep, I exactly. feel- And like, yeah, like we're Irish, but we don't, we 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 barely mentioned Ireland or like physical locations. I think we all have the appropriate amount of shame for being Irish. Yeah. Uh, majority of our audience are not Irish either. Mm-hmm. Uh, vast, vast majority. Vast. Yeah. Uh, that being said, if you are a listener and you, like, I, I wouldn't mind doing something in real life. I don't know what that'd be like, but that's up to the listeners to ask for. It's not our, it's not for mm-hmm. us to do. Mm. I would love more Irish listeners and more, just to be even acknowledged that we exist as a podcast in an Irish space. But I don't even know if the space exists. That's how we're outside of things we are. You know what I mean? Where's the scene? I don't know. Is there one? Maybe. Are we part of it? I don't think so. Would you guys guest on other Irish podcasts? I don't think anyone would want to. <laughs> yeah. I, don't I mean, like, no. I, I don't I've, know. I don't know. I, I'd, I'd give it a go, but like, then I don't want anyone guesting on ours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've guested on like a couple of podcasts and like it really, it's weird because it really depends on your chemistry with whoever you're doing it with. And sometimes it works out fine, but like sometimes, some sometimes it's kind of just a pain because it's like oh, you know you're, you're trying to establish a rhythm with the other person and it if it's not there it's just like ah damn it so I actually I turn down most podcast offers I get nowadays because I'm just like ah whatever yeah you got it it's, it's fine you've, 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 you've uh, got a flow it's good yeah I get uncomfortable if someone doesn't make fun of me for like 20 minutes so, <laughs> so thank you so much Rachel thank you Rachel we love you indeed hey hey it's our Patreon level up section This is from Cedric. Cheers from Down Under, mates. No way. Down Under. The Big Apple. Wow. Holy shit. Uh, the next one we have from JTTG. Hi, Neve, Brain, and Jims. Ooh. Absolutely love the podcast. Always a highlight of my week. Can I petition you guys to play Danganronpa 3's scrum debate music whenever you guys disagree on something? You sure can, buddy. You sure can. Neve, why don't you read this one from Shepherd Brackets, Rowdy Boy. Thanks for vibing and keeping it tight. If you need me, I'm on my mobile. Oh, we know that, Rowdy Boy. You don't need to say that. Sweet. I'll hit you up. Okay, with that, guys, we're going to move into the final section of our podcast. The Loot Drop. Oh, shit. Should we do a start doing a thing where, like... The beat drops just as we say, oh man. Neve, I don't know how to do that right in Audacity, on, so right do it, it with Neve. your mouth. <laughs> I'll link you some Roar. dub, it's, it's fine. Do you know, I, I remember in school, in supervised study, someone would go, and then another person, uh, like a couple of deaths away, would go, Pow! and it was fucking cool. Neve, what do you got? 
Oh yeah, I forgot I needed one. God fucking damn! <laughs> what song? You gonna sing, like link Chinese okay, new song? Me and Brian will go first. You go look up whatever fucking Korean bullshit you're gonna. Yeah, shiny, oh shiny have a new song. They do. And they I'm got a hot new this. track. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay, so I'm going to link a Tumblr thread that really brought me a lot of joy, <laughs> and it's called <laughs> "Toilets with Threatening Auras." And guys, you should see these fucking toilets. They're so threatening. Like, I promise you will not be let down. A lot of them are, like, public toilets. And it's like, okay, yeah, like, maybe someone let this place go. But some of them are, like, domestic toilets. Like, this is someone's house and they have made all these decisions. And they're like, please, take a seat. They're fucked up. Brian, uh, what do you got? Uh, I have a Stop Skeletons from Fighting video about uh, ROM and emulation of video games. Particularly about the preservation uh, uh, I think it's a really, really interesting argument, and I'm all for you know, downloading my games. I stop scaling. Your point is great. Yeah, this is this is one and of super. I've, I've chatted to him a bunch of times. He's a super chill dude. Yeah, He's so, really nice. It's a boyfriend and girlfriend who run the channel, isn't it? Originally, this guy was the happy video game nerd, which yeah. was like a kind of. Part flip on the angry video game nerd, and then he changed into stop skeletons for fighting, and that's when his girlfriend became part of the channel too. Yeah, so this Grace. is a, and Grace is also lovely. Yeah, so this 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 one is uh, presented by Grace, and she does a really really good job on it. But it's it's just because I I put extra games on my SNES, and I'm playing games that you can't really like they're not on the virtual console. There's no other way to play them, and I think like it's fair game. Yeah, I was actually looking at getting a Silent Hill Three running on my PC earlier, and it turns out there's you can't buy that game on PC anymore. It's 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 gone. It's like abandonware, and so your only options are the terrible remake or the PlayStation Two version. And so I just fucking downloaded it, and it's like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's a really 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 great video. I love their channel. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Eve, what do you got? Uh, mine is. St- Drucky, uh, she did the the parasocial relationships video. Yeah. She did one on the Hannibal TV series that I really, really liked and why it's good and why it works. Cool. I'm still recovering from the parasocial relationships video. <laughs> yeah, she goes hard. She sure does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we want to give our links? We are we, we're at, at Let's Fight a Boss on social media. Our email is ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com. Let's we, fight our patreon.com forward slash LFAB if you would like to get in on those sweet shout outs. Yeah. Our help support is make the podcast. That would also be great. Yeah, we're going to do a mukbang. We got to remember that. We got to eat. We didn't say that. We got to feed. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that. Hopefully later this month, if everything going according to plan, might be early next month, but we'll get there. Yeah, uh, certainly this season. Absolutely. We love you. Yes. Goodbye. Bye, friends. Spider-Man. Spider-Man.